Good evening, everyone. I think we're all just about here. Okay, why don't we go ahead and, and begin? It is 7.01. And uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to the San Bernardino City Council meeting of May the 25th, 2021. And we will call this meeting to order. May we please have roll call. Council Member Hamilton? Here. Council Member Mason? Here. Council Member Salazar? Here. Vice Mayor Marty Medina? Here. Mayor Rico Medina? Here. Um, I've realized that I've asked my colleagues to lead the pledge at one point or another, and I will go ahead and lead it this time. Um, also to acknowledge since Monday is Memorial Day, and unfortunately at the cemetery uh, there's uh, not having any public activity, but just on Memorial Day we remember the veterans who made the ultimate sacrifice for our country. These brave men and women have dedicated their lives to honor the living and make our lives better. Memorial Day, remember the veterans who made the ultimate sacrifice for our country. So with that, I will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, invisible, with liberty and justice for all. So now we'll move on to um, item number three, public comments for items not on the agenda. So if it's an item that's not on the current agenda, then this would be the opportunity in which um, to discuss. Individuals will be allowed up to three minutes. It is the council's policy to refer matters raised in this forum to staff for investigation and or action where appropriate. The Brown Act prohibits the council from discussing or acting upon any matter not agendized pursuant to state law. And if we have folks, that would be the up the time Please raise your virtual hand, and then we will um, start to begin and have the city clerk call in any folks. Go ahead, city clerk. I currently see no hands raised, but while we give a moment, I just want to say for anybody who is calling in by phone, if you would like to raise your hand, you can you can press star nine on your phone, and it will raise your virtual hand for us to see. I am still seeing no hands raised, Mayor. Okay, thank you, City Clerk. Okay, we'll move on to item number four, announcements and presentations. First item on the agenda is item A, uh, be issuing a proclamation recognizing June 2021 as Pride Month in San Bruno. And I'd like to bring in, um, he is on the San Mateo County LGB, LGBTQ Commission uh, for the County of San Mateo. Steve Dessart, if you would come on in, and I will read, I won't read every whereas is. I'd rather hear from Steve rather than myself, but let me just read uh, some portions of it, please. Whereas this nation was founded on the principle that every individual has infinite dignity and worth, and San Bruno calls upon the people of this municipality to embrace this principle and work to eliminate prejudice wherever it exists. And whereas celebrating Pride Month influences awareness and provides support and advocacy for the San Mateo County's LGBTQ community, and is an opportunity to take action and engage in dialogue to strengthen uh, alliances, build acceptance, and advance equal rights. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Rico E. Medina, hereby proclaim the month of June 2021 as Pride Month in support of the LGBT community. And I would like to, and I know it's virtual at this point, uh, but uh, Steve, if I could please turn it over to you. Good evening. Uh, thank you. What an honor to be amongst you tonight. Um, thank you so much for uh, your support um, of me uh, as a resident of our community, and I'll make some more formal comments. But personally, many of you I know, and I appreciate um, you so much. I also appreciate... Um, just how this city works. I got the app, the, the, the San Bruno app, and my God, you guys, boom, 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 boom. I am so impressed. 
Thank you, Linda, for giving me that tip. So city's working. Tax dollars are going to good use. I appreciate uh, that so much. Um, so uh, I'm proud to accept the city of San Bruno's LGBTQ proclamation on behalf of the San Mateo County LGBTQ Commission. Our commission's purpose is to bring greater recognition and visibility to the LGBTQ community in San Mateo County. Over the past several months, our commission has invited all cities and towns in San Mateo County to formally recognize Pride Month. This visibility allows LGBTQ residents to know that they are seen and that they are important. By issuing this proclamation, the city of San Bruno is visibly demonstrating how important it is for the LGBTQ youth, seniors, and those struggling with coming out to see their local government celebrate Pride Month. June is an extremely important month for the LGBTQ plus community. June marks the 51st anniversary of foundational Pride celebrations. It also is the sixth anniversary of the Supreme Court decision that legalized same-sex marriage. Although Pride Month is normally a time, time of unapologetically celebrating one's identity and boldly declaring love is love, this year, the LGBTQ community recognizes that it is more important than ever to be an ally to the African-American and AAPI communities. Pride celebrations actually have deep roots with protests and riots. The Compton Cafeteria riots occurred in August of 1966, marking the beginning of transgender activism in San Francisco. This event was one of the first LGBTQ plus related riots in US history, preceding the more famous 1969 Stonewall riots in New York City. During Stonewall, African American people like Marsha P. Johnson and so many others were the drivers of that movement, movement which started to turn the tide for LGBTQ community globally. It is important for us to continue to recognize and honor the LGBTQ community, the African American and AAPI communities and the intersectionality that brings these communities together as we continue to fight for equality. Thank you, Mayor Medina, the City Council and the City of San Bruno for your allyship and support. Thank you. Stephen, thank you for your comments and thank you for being here this evening. We very much appreciate it. And um, we will let you, uh, we won't require you to stay for the whole meeting. You're welcome to, but uh, please enjoy your evening. All right. Thank you so much. Take care. Take care. Bye -bye. Now we'll move on to um, item B. And there's some announcements. Announce that we are helping PG&E with their reminder to be aware of scams targeting PG&E customers. Customers should stay vigilant recognize and avoid financial scams. PG&E will never ask for your financial information over the phone or via email and will never demand immediate payment for any alleged past due bills. More information may be found at www.pge or just pge.com backslash scams. And so that's just as a reminder to every, all folks. And again, if you're not sure, please call them. Uh, item C, announce that the COVID-19 vaccine is here and available to California ages 12 plus with parental consent. Most, most vaccine locations do not require an appointment. Visit www.smchealth.org. Of course, you look up the vaccine clinic calendar for dates and times of local vaccine clinics or visit my turn. .ca.gov. That's myturn.ca.gov. For those not online, you can also call for vaccine information to 833-422-4255. Again, that's 833-422-4255. Um, there's one item that, that is not listed, but I've asked very briefly for our fire chief, if our fire chief can be brought into the meeting, please. Um, and basically, uh, myself and uh, my colleagues have gotten uh, an email or two or inquiry in regards to the canyon. So I thought uh, we would take this opportunity um, just very briefly for Chief Lay to. Uh, chief? Sure. Uh, 
Sure, Honorable Mayor, members of the council, Ari DeLay, your fire chief. Um, just uh, a bit of information for the community. Um, uh, beginning uh, on Monday and working through this week, we'll be doing some uh, wildland fire training in Crestmore Canyon. Um, it provided us a great opportunity. Um, if everybody remembers, uh, a few weeks ago, we noted that we were able to receive a uh, Type 6 fire engine from Cal OES. Uh, we've used that opportunity to, to do some joint training with our partner agencies uh, that all receive the same type of apparatus. Uh, South San Francisco Fire Department, San Bruno, obviously, uh, Central County Fire Department, and the San Mateo County uh, or Consolidated Fire Department. We've all been training in Crestmore Canyon throughout the week, and it's uh, really designed to uh, utilize and, and exercise these new vehicles and also uh, get prepared for wildland season here. And it's a great opportunity for them to know uh, some of our geography and terrain uh, in San Bruno and get them more familiar with it in case we did have an event. So um, if there's any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer anything for you. Okay. Um, with that, thank you, Chief. And just we want to take the opportunity uh, for those watching or can pass on information to the community. So thank you, uh, Chief DeLay. And with that, that concludes our uh, announcements and presentations. We're going to move on to consent calendar. That's item five. All items are considered routine or implemented in earlier council action and may be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion unless requested. So at this time, are there any items that we want to pull for a complete staff report and separate vote? Uh, Councilman Mason. Oh. Muted. Sorry, not, not for a separate vote. Oh, oh, wait a minute. No worries. I'm not seeing any. So are there items that uh, we would like to either uh, have a question, maybe a follow-up detail from staff? Uh, Mr. Hamilton? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought, I thought, I thought I saw this. <laughs> uh, uh, Councilmember Mason, you said. Yeah, I think um, if we – I just have some follow-up questions, I think, for F and G – um, then one second, I'm just looking at this list. And that, that's it. That's it. I think the other questions have been answered. Thank you. FNG, thank you. Um, anybody else from council? Not seeing any. Then we have two items. Uh, oh, I'm apologize. sorry. Yes, Vice Mayor. Um, that would be item G. Got it. A quick comment on item H. And um, item D. Thank you, seeing no others. Uh, I'm gonna start at the top and we'll work our way down if that's okay. So we'll start with item F, hmm. as in Frank, appoint uh, Rico and Michael to the city council subcommittee or ad hoc committee to review firework and permit applications in preparation for the sale of state and saying fireworks in San Bruno. And again, it is supposed to say, and the process. Uh, council Member Mason. Councilmember Mason, you're muted. I'm sorry, thank you. Um, so in reading through the uh, staff report and the attachments, I, I guess I just have a question around the um, review by the ad hoc committee. Um, I, I'm fine with the ad hoc committee, but I think my question is more around the, the process and what the ad hoc committee actually reviews. So based on the question that I asked of staff and the response I got, uh, it would be good to better understand or better or give more opportunities um, for others to actually have a stand. So for those members of the public, um, there was a question that was sent earlier around who was noticed of the opportunity to have a fireworks stand. Um, nine, in, nine groups are grandfathered in, and then nine groups are eligible to um, have an additional stand. Um, and the noticing from the answer we, uh, that the council received is that they noticing of the opportunity for these stands only went to those who had stands the previous year. And so um, I do just want to ask how, and maybe this is a question for the city attorney, but um, how can we ensure that the noticing is more public? It would be great to give this opportunity to the PTAs, for example, if they're offered or they have the ability to within their own rules and regulations. Um, maybe the Parkside. Um, Parkside has a number of different uh, organizations that are made up of parents. 
Um, these could really help our public schools in San Bruno. Um, the Education Foundation may be interested. Um, I have not spoken with any of them. Um, they just came right when I looked at the applications. I noticed that those were all missing. Um, and I don't know what other nonprofit organizations might be in the city that might be interested in having a stand. And so um, without actually giving notice to anybody outside of those who applied the year before, uh, I just think it's not fair to other organizations that may want that opportunity. I don't know. I'm sorry. I see. Uh, I can kind of tell. I see Mark, um, uh, the city attorney. I apologize. Uh, did you want, have anything to say, or since I see you? Yes. Sorry. I was having trouble finding my unmute button. <laughs> <laughs> you, you. You think after a year and a half of this, we'd know where the unmute button is? But um, apparently, I don't. Um, so certainly, if the city council wishes to direct staff to provide additional notice, they they could certainly do that. Um, there's no legal requirement to have provided notice, nor any legal prohibition why additional notice couldn't be provided. It's, I mean, I think the rules do say that there has to be notice. I think it just doesn't provide who the notice has to be provided to, right? So is this, uh, is this something that we have to be agendized at a later time for next year? Since this process is already, we're already in June, or practically in June? Uh, so I'm... Uh, understanding from the city clerk and uh, Melissa please feel free to speak up that um, the nonprofits and I see the city manager has a has his hand up as well um, that it staff doesn't know who's interested and who isn't and so in the past it's been incumbent upon the nonprofits who are uh, generally familiar with the fact that San Bruno has fireworks and you can have firework stands to come to the city and request that and we do know that has happened in the past, um, but apparently it may not have happened this year that there were other entities that decided to come in. Correct, and I do want to add, I'm sorry, um, this is Melissa Thurman, City Clerk. I do want to add that um, in years past, we have had um, uh, school um, nonprofit groups interested. Parkside did it for a couple of years and eventually pulled out. Um, we post this notice on Channel One so that the public is, uh, that watches our Channel One slides is, is aware that they can come in and get an application if they so choose. Um, yeah, they, it would be pretty hard for us to know who is interested. It would be better for anybody who knows of a nonprofit in the community that may be interested to direct them to come to the city clerk's office for an application. And then the uh, uh, city manager. Sure, Javon Rogan, city manager. Uh, I think this is a quite simple uh, uh, issue. So I think what we have is a request to expand the noticing uh, subsequently, and we can certainly do that. Uh, what I've heard this time is that the notice was posted on Channel 1, as the city clerk said, as well as to all of the groups that have uh, participated in the fireworks stands in the past. Uh, and what I hear Council Member Mason articulating Let's just broaden that. Uh, next year, uh, uh, expand it out, uh, uh, do a more general notice that can pick up nonprofits that uh, may not have participated in, in the process before or nonprofits that we don't know about. And so we can certainly uh, do that and do more of a general citywide noticing, uh, whether it's putting it in the city manager's newsletter, posting it on social media, what have you. I think we can uh, get the word out. So I think it's a fairly simple uh, request to, to do and um, so noted and uh, staff will be directed to do, to do that. Okay, great, thank you. And, I, and um, just because I don't know how this happened in the past since COVID was last year, um, as far as just inviting organizations to come and speak about their organization, it does. It says in the um, policy that, or the procedure um, that was in the staff report that um, the council can request this. So again, I don't know if this needs to be agendized separately, but um, I, I'm not familiar with a, a couple of these groups, and I would love to hear from the groups about their organization, and it's really an opportunity to see how these funds really help their organizations, um, you know, because I, I think that um, these fireworks stands are huge, not, uh, huge fundraisers for some of these organizations. So same thing. I don't know if that would be something that the ad hoc committee would request that we direct the ad hoc committee to do or... Uh, if it's been done before, um, I, I did see the notice that it doesn't sound like it had been done in recent years. 
but um, I would love to hear from some of these organizations. I think it would just be really beneficial for the council and the public to hear about what they do and, and how they benefit the San Bruno community. Th that's it for my, my comments, and then if someone can provide direction on how we would make that happen, that would be great. Thank you. Great. City Manager, do you have your hand up again, or was that from before? Uh, that uh, was a new hand raised to address council member Mason's latest comment. And so my recommendation would be uh, the ad hoc uh, committee discusses that uh, in a process to invite, uh, I would say, a select group uh, to provide a report out. Uh, one of the things that um, is a challenge with our business meetings, uh, as council knows, is that they begin at 7 o'clock. And so the more announcements and presentations we have means the later we're getting to the business item. And given that there are 18 groups, uh, I would suggest that the ad hoc committee just think about the process and uh, maybe find one or two groups to highlight uh, or invite some representatives to the meeting and, and you know, keep it really short, uh, really quick. Yeah, I'd like to expound upon that. Um, the reason I want I want an, an process on there was for some of these questions, because the resolution goes back to 2008. It's also the fact of, is it necessary to have an ad hoc committee of the council review the applications which have been reviewed by the city clerk and maybe we're just having another layer that isn't necessary or required and so that is also I was hoping to um, examine that as well if, it, if there's not a need then it must not duplicate efforts um, and so I know Mr. Salazar has had some uh, experience on this Did it last year for the first time so I just was trying to get some that walked through it before and then go ahead and then bring back to council on some of those questions that have been raised, um, but also about the process is, does it need the ad hoc committee? If they have applications, we have a, my understanding is a general understanding of what, what they do, how they give back, uh, which you know any council person would have the opportunity to see. So anyway, um, that was another one of my uh, thoughts. Uh, anything else from my colleagues on item X? Okay, seeing none, we're gonna move on to item G. Uh, item G is adopt a resolution approving the final map and authorizing the city manager to execute an improvement agreement, maintenance agreement, stormwater treatment measure maintenance agreement, and an affordable housing agreement for the project at 111 San Bernardino Ave, Avenue and 761-767 Huntington Avenue. And there were uh, two colleagues. Uh, first, we'll start with Councilmember Mason, then go to Vice Mayor Medina. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask, I think for more so for the benefit of the public, there's been so much discussion around downtown and the status of downtown. And as we know, uh, this 111 Huntington is going to bring you right into our downtown. I would actually consider part of our downtown. Um, so I just wanted to ask from a very uh, high, like a high level if staff can provide a um, quick overview on what the maintenance agreement um, is and what it looks like. I was very happy to see it in the staff packet. Um, and I think it would just be beneficial for the public to know that the city is taking measures to ensure that our landlords are taking care of their properties as they develop and after they develop. Yes. Sure. Um, let me, if, if, okay, maybe I can ask the vice mayor too so that when staff answers, maybe they can in, incorporate everything at once, please. Right. Vice mayor. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I have two questions. Um, basically, after tonight's uh, vote, um, where are we with the permitting and anticipated construction schedule? And uh, question two is, is I was able to uh, send it, it into staff beforehand. And my question was, does this project exclude the residents that are living there from participating in a residential parking permit program. And it was my understanding that at the meeting, the, uh, the applicant uh, expressed no objection to, to that requirement. Um, however, um, that requirement didn't make it in to an agreement. So where, what options are we do we have at this point? Um, those are my two questions, Mr. Mayor. Okay, uh, City Manager, do you have your hand up or should I turn it over to Ms. Ritchie? 
Yes, uh, really quick through the mayor. So uh, there are three questions. One question from Council Member Medina about the maintenance agreement, uh, and then two questions uh, from Council Member, I'm sorry, one question from Council Member Mason about the maintenance agreement. And then two questions from Council Member Medina, one about the permitting status and another with regard to the residential parking for program. Before we answer those three questions, uh, I want to ask our interim public works director, Haywan Ritchie, to give a very brief overview of the project because it seems like we're going to get into a little nuance about the project. And I think it's important for the, the public that's watching to have a little background on what we're talking about. With that said, Mr. Mayor, it seems like Councilmember Mason may have another question. I'm sorry. Yeah, Councilmember Mason? I, I'm sorry. I'm just. I might as well group them in together, but when you talk about the maintenance agreement, I um, love that you talked about weeds and um, garbage, and so can you just make sure you address um, the time frame that the city will be pro uh, providing to the owner to actually remedy the situation? Thank you. Uh, Ms. Ritchie. Yes. Good morning, Honorable Mayor, City Council members. Uh, my name is Helen Ritchie, the Interim Public Works Director. Um, I would like to present, uh, share my screen, some brief slides here. Okay, so the title slide, um, approximate location of 111 San Bruno Avenue is at the southwest corner of San Bruno Avenue West and Huntington Avenue. This is a close-up view of the, an aerial of this location. It is outlined in red. These are some architectural renderings. Project overview. The building is five stories. It contains 62 residential units, of which 11 are affordable housing with six low income and five moderate income. There's approximately 7,800 square feet of ground floor commercial. Previous approvals include the transit corridors plan amendment, plan development permit, architectural review permit, vesting tenant map, two loading zone spaces on southbound Huntington Avenue. Public improvements will include new curb, gutter, sidewalk, driveway ramps, pavement, water sewer storm drain improvements, street lights, traffic signal modification, street trees and landscaping, and irrigation developed landscaping. Um, before you tonight is the request to approve the final map, as well as authorize city managers to execute um, various agreements, including improvement, maintenance, stormwater treatment measures, and affordable housing agreements. With that, um, I can uh, help to answer several of the questions. So, um, Councilmember Mason, you had asked about the maintenance agreement. What those, what that includes is, um, so as part of the improvement agreement, there will be various improvements um, off-site. So that's within the public right-of-way, and those were listed as um, in the previous slide. So what the maintenance agreement does is ensure that the project improvements will be maintained um, to city standards um, for various facilities. And so what that does allow for is you know, enhanced maintenance of public improvements by the private property owner. So certain things that may have customarily been um, maintained by the city, such as street trees or lights, those would now be maintained by the private property owner through this maintenance agreement. And what this maintenance agreement allows is that um, upon noticing um, and 30 days to correct the measure, um, that if you know if that were not to occur, the city could step in and um, you know well initially provide the notice. And if that the remedy doesn't occur, then it affords the city the ability to perform the work and seek um, compensation for uh, the time and cost to perform that work. Thank you. And then regarding the status of the permits, um, they are there are a few pending um, 
permits for city review, which include the shoring building encroachment permit for public improvements. Um, the permit plans for public improvements are near complete. Um, however, there are pool items that still require some um, additional coordination between the applicant and the city um, before the encroachment permit for the public improvements um, can be issued. And so um, there's last, you know, few remaining items to be um, worked through, uh, but it is very close. Um, I, I think this item tonight, uh, the final map and agreements will um, certainly uh, move the project forward. And um, I believe there are still um, building permits um, also to be obtained. And regarding the uh, residential parking permit program, um, possibly if I could request the city manager or the city attorney to help assist with that question. Uh, through, the, through the mayor, uh, Javon Rogan, city, city manager, I'll address that question. So just to recap for uh, the council and the public, the question from council member Medina was, uh, can the city uh, prohibit the property from participating in a future residential parking program? And I believe what council member Medina referenced is that at a prior meeting, uh, there was an expressed interest uh, or non-reluctance um, from the uh, developer that they may be okay with that exclusion. Upon subsequent conversation, as this project went through the, um, the process to bring it here tonight, uh, that agreement was not included in the documents that are before you. The council may remember that that requirement uh, was in the Mills Park project as a developer concession as part of a development agreement. We do not have a development agreement with this project. Thus, we are not allowed, We are not able to um, get that as a concession, uh, a negotiated concession, if the developer or property owner is not willing. Uh, I did um, contact the uh, developer today and confirm that they are comfortable with the documents as presented to council uh, and uh, not supportive at this time of excluding the project from a future residential parking program. Uh, the project is not asking for a parking concession, and staff's analysis is that we do not, based on our objective standards, have the ability to exclude this project from a future residential parking program if it is not a negotiated concession. Uh, and so uh, while there was a uh, conversation about that, it is not in the agreements that are before you currently tonight. Okay, so I... I believe the questions were answered that there might be some follow-up to it. Uh, I also want to be able to open it up. We have uh, somebody from the community who would like to speak on this item. And again, this is in regards to the property at 111 San Bernal Avenue and 761-767 Huntington Avenue. City Clerk, if you can bring in um, Mr. Triple. Yes, I'm Moshi Dinar. Bring you in, Mr. Dinar. It's not just one moment. I'm getting an error here. There we go. I think I got it. I'm trying to get you unmuted. I'm having some trouble here. If you're able to unmute yourself, will you please hit the unmute button? Yeah. Um... There you are. Okay. We can Hello. hear you whenever you're ready. I'm ready now. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Moshe Dinar. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak at your meeting. I'm the architect for the project. I've been working with planning, public works, and the, the whole city staff on this project for six and a half years. We are reaching an important milestone in our process in the sense that with the approval of these agreements and the approval of the final map, we will be able to obtain a permit to do the off-site improvements and make improvements to the city's uh, utilities uh, along the street and then start the construction of our building. Uh, so we're very happy. We're very excited. We want to thank you for the time that you've spent listening to us in various presentations and various neighborhood meetings. Uh, thank you again. Uh, as far as the parking is concerned, I'd like to say that the 
the amount of space available for parking is extremely limited. We are, we have a very, very expensive parking system. It is three high, it goes down on the ground and comes back up. It requires the availability of, uh, of a credit card type thing for each resident to, to, uh, to operate. And I think that we have enough to satisfy all our residents um, so I don't know about possibly participating in other uh, programs, if it's possible. Um, certainly the owner may consider it, but I don't think we have enough to, to, uh, to park uh, people outside the building and their guests. Um, other than that, I, I, uh, I feel that um, we have a, a great building and we're looking forward to its construction in the city of San Bruno. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your comments. If there's anybody else who wishes to speak on this item, if you could raise your hand now. I see one more speaker, and this will be the last speaker. I'm not seeing any other hands come up, but let's see, Clerk, if you could bring in our next speaker. All right. Yes, just one moment. Um, the next speaker is Stephen Seymour. Hello. Hi, Stephen, whenever you're ready. All right. I just wanted to, uh, it, it's exciting that this project is moving forward. Um, the property has been vacant for so long, it'll be nice to have neighbors there. Um, I do want to uh, express my concern that uh, the um, property is going to be able to, or is not, uh, uh, taken out of what might be a residential parking permit program in and around the area. And my biggest concern there are well, two. I have one. I mean, the first one is um, the owner um, expressed in a meeting uh, when uh, Council Member Medina asked if they would be willing <coughs> to uh, not take part in residential parking permit programs. They said absolutely. They said that no problem. And I'm, so it's, it's, it's really a concern to me that that was not put into the agreement. Um, and I think my second issue is, is I think that really uh, is something that you're going to have to look at hard in the transit corridor because the idea is to build uh, multifamily units uh, through the corridor and you're building those multifamily units next to neighborhoods that are already parking impacted. It makes sense to me that the developer, the owner of future buildings would make sure that their properties are able to support the people who will be living. Mr. Seymour, we lost your audio. I can hear apprehension in his voice that the system that they've put in place will be able to support all of the people that uh, will be moving into that building and their, their uh, uh, neighbors and and family members and friends that may be visiting them. So <clears throat> I'm, I'm pretty concerned that we didn't uh, have this, <clears throat> have the uh, developer uh, exclude themselves from a future park permit program. And I think you are going to have to work on making sure that happens for future development in this area because the neighborhoods cannot take another car. Thank you very much for your, um, for, for listening. Thank you for your comments. So there are no other speakers, so we'll, uh, that'll be in the public comment on this item under consent. We'll bring it back to the City Council for any uh, follow-up questions or comments. Uh, Council Member Hamilton. So I, I just want to, um, uh, Mr. Dinar was correct, it's been, this, this project has been a very long time coming. Um, in fact, way back when I was on the TSPC, this project came before us to approve a um, to approve a, um, a loading zone. And at that time, this was I might have been five years ago. Um, the at at that time, one of my um, co-committee members just made a comment. We were not voting on whether there was enough, there was enough parking in this building because that was not that was not before us, and there wasn't any decision to be made about that. But one of my um, committee uh, fellow committee members commented that she did not believe there was enough parking in this building. And the uh, Mr. Dinar was at that meeting and spoke at length about that there was plenty of parking. 
And um, so it is, it is a little um, disconcerting to hear the, the, the change over time. Um, uh, in, in that regard, what you know, after after it's all been approved, I'm still going to vote yes on it, but it's still it is still a concern, and I think this is something that we need to to um, watch for in the future as we as we move ahead to get things in, you know in, in get the, get these types of things in writing um, and built into the into the agreements as 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 we can legally moving forward. Thank you. Any other uh, final questions from colleagues? Uh, Vice Mayor Medina. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so my my question, look, look, I want to see this project built too, and I think that over the years, as the community understood, okay, they're going to have enough parking for 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 their residents and guests, and a benefit to our community to having more homes, but it was, I think I think we were led to believe that if there was a parking permit program, the residents at this location wouldn't participate in it. And why this is so important is that we know currently parking anywhere near that building is extremely difficult. Um, so legally, um, I, the question then would be to the city attorney, this is not what we're voting on right now. But of that part, it seems, has already passed to approve the project, and we didn't have that in there. Um, so I'd like to, like to have uh, our city attorney opine on that. So you're correct, Vice Mayor Medina. The what's in front of you tonight are the improvement agreements only, and not um, the relitigation of the conditions of approval for the project. Thank you very much, City Attorney Zafirano. Um I would, I would, I would ask the. I'm asking the developer that it's the right thing to do. Um, having your future residents out potentially uh, further impacting the parking isn't very neighborly um, and we will make sure that uh, we'll do as much as we can to make sure this doesn't happen again thank you yeah and the only thing um, um, that I would suggest is so that it's really documented, I think, uh, when it goes through the process. And if we find ourselves in, in this unique situation to where it, it is one of those larger developments that's within a neighborhood area, that it's that it's stipulated yay or nay, that it's on there, people are agreeing to it, the process is going through, and therefore there's, there's nobody's, you know, if it's, they said five years ago, six years ago, that it, it's hard and, and folks change, council changes, staff changes, uh, members change. So. Um, I think going forward, it would be helpful if it was something that was uh, within the, that process, so at least it's it's noted, it's understood, and everybody's on the same page. My my thought. Um, anything else on? And that was G. Um, I'm going to move on to item H. Waive the second reading and adopt amendments to the San Bernardino Municipal Code Chapter 2.36 to complete transition of personnel board functions at the City Manager's Office and Human Resources. Department, uh, Vice Mayor. This is going to be really quick, Mr. Mayor. Just wanted to acknowledge that I did receive a text from Peter Fenn, uh, 856, indicating he had no objection to uh, the uh, change in, in our uh, committee. Thank you, Vice Mayor. And I just had one quick question to City Manager, because um, I know the personnel board used to deal with um, the uh, the list. When I say list, captain's list, um, et cetera. And and as far as our battalion chief list and how long it would stay out there, we go to the personnel board. They would have um, input whether to extend the list or not, and and go out for another. So how is that going to be facilitated now? So. 
we have gone to the Park and Rec Commission with um, appropriations from Park and Loop funds, and I'm wondering if that has gone through the commission yet, and are they aware that we're uh, proposing use of those funds for this project? City Manager. Sure. Um, Councilmember Salazar, uh, it is our intention to take uh, the finalized plans uh, to Park and Rec uh, Commission. Uh, so, so they can see those, and we will. Uh, I do not know if they, um, uh, if, if it has gone to them just yet. Um, I, unfortunately, right now I'm just blank on what the last agenda <laughs> was for the Park and Rec Commission, uh, but I believe it has not. Uh, but uh, regardless, we will take it to them uh, for, for their input. I wanted to uh, also, uh, you know, that's one thing that I know in the past that some commissioners were not uh, pleased, shall we say, that that topic, not that they controlled the, the money, but we do bring those things by them to get their input. They have it on their agenda for the public. Um, the other thing is, is I know, and I know you're having just to kind of throw something out now, but to go to, from 80 to 150, almost doubling it, um, it concerns me a little bit. I mean, it was 125. I know it's like Rico. What's 25 thousand dollars? But just doubling it at a, at a at a moment's notice does concern me a little bit. Um, and I know I think city manager. My assumption would be that you're kind of obviously having to just kind of think about what what it could cost, not really knowing. Absolutely, uh, council member. I believe it was in uh, April that we brought the concept to you, and council direction was. If you can identify funding, bring this to us as soon as possible so you can implement this project. Uh, and so that, that is why it is before you. Uh, in, in fact, the direction is we were going to include the, the funding in the proposed budget that would be uh, adopted late June and available July 1. And council's direction was, uh, frankly, bring it to us sooner so we can get these, uh, these improvement, improvements implemented downtown as soon as possible. And so that is why it is to you uh, this soon. And yes, the recommendation to increase to 80 to 150 was not um, an attempt to sort of double the budget. It was sort of to provide enough funds to get the job done. And uh, again, any funds that are not spent will be returned to the Park and Loop Fund. Uh, and we will certainly take the final design and, and, and the concept to the Park and Rec Commission uh, and then move forward expeditiously. I think part of the, the concept of getting these improvements done soon is uh, summer is fast approaching and having Centennial Plaza uh, reactivated for the summer and potentially additional places for outdoor uh, dining was of high importance. And so uh, we, we are trying to accomplish your mission uh, and uh, both having, uh, not wanting to have to come back for additional authority is why I said increase to 150. Know that we will be diligent with the bond as we always are. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, we're gonna go to Council Member Hamilton, then we'll take a uh, comment from the public. So um, might I suggest that, uh, you know, I, I, I want to see improvements here as well, and, but I also don't like to see the, the budget go up by this much without knowing exactly what we're getting for it and, and all of that, and and, uh, and also don't want to put that on the spot to have to try to guess at that. Um, would an, could a viable option be that we approve, we approve the 80000 as is, and then as the, as the final design is put, put forth, staff would be able to tell us that it would cost X. X thousand more to put in lighting or whatever this you know the specific proposal uh, proposal so that we can add to it later if we so choose, but approve this so that we can get started on it um, for all the reasons that the city manager just outlined. That's what I will recommend for today. I think that might be a question for city manager. Yeah, maybe I should have phrased it as a question. Is that a feasible course of action? We can absolutely bring another staff report and a appropriation request back to the city council. Uh, and what that would mean is that we would not be able to enter into the contract for the full amount. Uh, we would attempt to uh, give the vendor a um, an, an initial task order for the work that we have budgeted, and then uh, pr bring another staff report back to the city council, uh, as well as go through the uh, park and recognition. Uh, and so it may it may have a time impact. It may not. I literally don't know right now. Um, but if we would like to increase um, uh, the work that we're doing, it's certainly going to come at, a, at an additional cost. If that cost exceeds $80,000, we'll come back if, if that's council's desire. Or you can provide an additional allocation now, uh, knowing that that would go to the Park and Rec Commission and any funds that are not spent would be returned back to the Park and Loop Fund. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, if 
there's anybody from the public, because we do have somebody from the public who would like to speak on this, now would be the opportunity to re raise your hand. Again, this is in regards to the uh, short-term plan to activate Centennial Plaza. Um, City Clerk, if you can bring in our speaker. Yes, Paul yes. Wapensky. Good evening. Um, I'm, I'm just concerned about what I just heard. Uh, if you have a budget, that means you've already planned and did cost estimates. And just throwing out numbers and shotgunning is, is not a way to do business. We, if you can update the budget to 150, that's fine, but you should have some justification behind it. Um, it it's really, you know, it's the taxpayer money, and it's just saying that we'll return it, but we don't spend, you know, government uh, usually doesn't uh, give money back, so they're going to spend what you give them. So we should. You know, have a budget. What's needed gets spent. What doesn't need it doesn't get spent. But just shotgunning is, I, I think it's a bad way to do business. If this was a regular uh, business instead of the government, they would throw you out of the office. That's all I got. Thank you for your comments. I am not seeing anybody else from the public, so we'll um, close off for public comment and bring it back to Council. Vice Mayor Medina. Yeah, in, de in defense of, of that last statement, um, it, it probably would be beneficial to share the original concept that had decomposed granite, and there's a fountain there, and when decomposed granite gets wet, it's not the best material to, to stand on, and the addition of pavers um, is a substantial... Uh, improvement on a on a on a surface. Um, so I I believe that this is going to be in that condition for quite a while because we don't have a long term solution to work to do with that property, um, and we need something that looks nice and. I want to see us move forward with it. Um, to only allow eighty thousand dollars is not going to be enough. That was a preliminary budget based on quickly putting something together at the council's direction. So um, I'm okay with allocating the amount. I, I trust staff will do their best to make sure that they're going to be careful with spending those dollars. Um, it's also important to remember, it needs to look nice. It's nearly the centerpiece of our downtown. And for too long, it looked the way it looked. I'm in support of the 150. And I guess we're gonna have to have a separate vote for this agenda item. Um, I'll check with the city attorney, but maybe the motion could be if it were to modify that, or if it needs to be a separate vote, we can always certainly do that. that city attorney? From understanding, you can't include that in the in the original motion if somebody wants to make that. Okay, thank you. Um, is there any other uh, questions or comments? Okay, you know, I and I know it does say short term, and I will tell you, I remember the day that it was Wells Fargo. I remember the day it was a lot with a, a fence that collected weeds and uh, uh, newspapers that blew. Um, and I think our intent is short term, but in all honesty, I think the short term will become something longer. Um, everybody has a definition of what short term and long term are, um, but I believe the intent is for short term. However, with no fault to the staff or anyone else, and I go back to when it is what it is today, it was done in-house with what was currently at its disposal. When I say its disposal, what Parks had, uh, to put that together. So it's a very nominal cost, and that's why it was done, because it was to be temporary. Well, obviously, we know that's it's not temporary. So um, anyway, I just wanted to remind folks of that. So with that said, we are concluded with item J. We have consent for items A through J. Um, and at this time, you could make a motion, as I've indicated, that modifies the resolution on J if there is council direction for action. Uh, Vice Mayor Medina. Yes, Mayor Medina, I'd like to 
make a motion to approve the consent calendar with the amendment to item J, increasing it to 150,000. Through the chair, if we if we could before that gets seconded, uh, if that if that if there is going to be a change to that one item, then I would like that item pulled and voted on separately. Yeah, uh, I, there was a motion. I haven't had a second yet, but there's been a which could be an amendment to the motion, which would be to pull it and have a vote se uh, separately. Um, does the uh, motion maker have a problem if we revert back and just deal with A through I first? I have no problem with that. That's, that's why I suggested that we pull it, but that's okay. Absolutely, no problem. Okay, just if it wasn't necessary, then we didn't have to. Uh, Council Member Hamilton? I, I would also, um, uh, I, I think it should be a separate, uh, voted on separately, not, not all together. And um, I would make a suggestion uh, to the motion maker that you also include the specific direction that excess funds be returned to the parking lot fund. I think that, that, that should be part of the, the motion in my opinion. Okay, so let's go with consent. Items A through I. Is there uh, action from council? Move to approve. Second. Okay, um, City Clerk, uh, I'll let you figure out who was second, <laughs> who seconded it. But we have a motion and a second. Uh, and Mr. Hamilton says it, it doesn't matter either way. Uh, roll call, please. Council Member, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Council Member Hamilton. Aye. Council Member Mason. Aye. Council Member Salazar. Aye. Vice Mayor Marty Medina. Aye. Mayor Rick Medina. Aye. Motion carried. Yep. Thank you very much, City Clerk. Now we have item J, uh, action from Council, a separate vote. Mr. Mayor? Uh, uh, Vice Mayor? Yes, I'd like to make a motion to approve item J with the amending the amount from 80 to 150,000 with the remaining funds to be returned to the uh, parking lot fund. I'll second. Motion made on the second on on the question. There was also about it going to the Park and Rec Commission. Is that um, for review? Is that still part of the motion, or is that assumed? I don't want to assume. Mr. Mayor, that would be assumed. Okay. Is that correct, Mr. Hamilton? Sure. Okay. <laughs> okay. Roll call, please. Council Member Hamilton. Aye. Council Member Mason. Aye. Council Member Salazar? Well, I wholeheartedly support the, the project and the, the submission that staff did. I, I can't um, support changing the budget so dramatically at the, at the last hour, and so I'm going to have to vote no. Vice Mayor Marty Medina? Aye. Mayor Rico Medina? Aye. And I'm voting aye because I just am concerned the short term will not be, but um, I appreciate it, and I, and I do agree that uh, this should not be the norm for council to double budget processes as we've given direction to staff and, and, and then that going forward, in my opinion. Um, okay, so that's it for consent. We're gonna move on to conduct of business, which is number six on the agenda. And we will first, we'll go to item A, city clerk. Item 6A, receive the third quarter financial update report for fiscal year 2020-21 as of March 31st, 2021 and adopt a resolution approving the third quarter budget amendment for the fiscal year 2020-21 operating and capital budget. And uh, we're gonna have our city manager as well as our director, finance director Sun. And what I would ask is if uh, there is about 23 slides. So if we could let them get through their presentation and then we will start opening it up for questions. Uh, city manager. Sure. Uh, Mayor Medina, we are totally ready uh, to go forward with 6A. Um, however, I would like to request, if possible, that we take item 6C. We do have uh, the county's animal control and licensing manager with us, uh, and uh, she is, she is uh, ready to attend and support this item. Uh, with your concurrence. Uh, yes, I do see in the attendees uh, uh, the representative from the county, and obviously I think this uh, – the budget process may take a little bit of time with its presentations and questions from the community as well as from council. So, yeah, um, I'm fine to move up uh, the item C so we can have that presentation and allow the, the other uh, person not to have to stay with us. 
authorizing the city manager to execute an agreement with the County of San Mateo for continued provision of animal control services for a five-year term beginning July 1st, 2021. Manager. Sure. Uh, thank you, council members of the public. Uh, Javon Brogan, city manager. I will be presenting the item tonight, and thank you again for moving this uh, item up. We have Lori morton Fezzel, uh, the animal control and licensing manager uh, with San Mateo County, uh, here to answer any questions on the contract. Uh, she is uh, attending uh, four city council meetings tonight uh, doing a virtual round robin uh, because this agreement is going to all 20 cities uh, in, in the county. And so let's begin uh, with the objective. The objective tonight is to provide information on the proposed agreement with the County of San Mateo for continued provision of animal control services for a five-year term. Uh, as council uh, knows, I have been a part of this uh, process since 2019 uh, when there was an extension of the current contract and, and an audit, uh, and I, I served on a panel of city of five city managers in the county uh, for the RFP and for the contract negotiations. And so this agreement will be for five years beginning again July 1, 2021 and ending June 30, 2025. The agenda for tonight's uh, presentation is we will provide a background, we will discuss the agreement, we will discuss the financial impact, uh, and then discuss recommendations. And, and finally take questions. So by way of background, uh, shared services uh, is something we talk about a lot. Uh, animal control is actually the longest serving uh, shared regional service in our county. Uh, it has uh, uh, been that way since 1952 uh, when the county contracted with Peninsula Humane Society and the SPCA, uh, commonly referred to as PHS, uh, for animal uh, control, uh, field, and sheltering services. Again, all 20 cities plus the county uh, participate in this agreement, and, and, and frankly, we do that because we pool our resources and uh, uh, the economies of scale actually uh, saves money. And so this agreement, is, as you'll see in a little bit, uh, costs the city approximately $370,000 annually. Uh, and that's a cost uh, that would be much greater if we did it alone or partnered with a, just a few other cities. In addition, uh, the, count, the council and members of the public may know that through this countywide participation, uh, we all jointly funded a $30 million animal shelter uh, and it's a uh, 45,000 square foot state-of-the-art facility that our residents uh, enjoy and, and, and can use due to this county partnership. So by, by way of background, animal control is not something that we talk about often uh, uh, here at our city council uh, meetings, but we are mandated to provide animal control services. And a few of those functions are receiving and housing stray animals, uh, serving as a location for the public uh, when looking for lost pets um, and surrendering animals, uh, sheltering animals, uh, holding a spay and neuter clinic, as well as a vaccination clinic. There are other um, services that we provide for convenience, uh, and we'll talk a about a little, a, a few of these. And one is licensing, another is microchipping, and veterinary care and be uh, behavioral work. And, and, and so that's for aggressive animals to um, get them to be not so aggressive. So the agreement. Uh, the agreement currently will expire June 30th, 2021, hence why uh, the, the renewed agreement uh, is important for, this, for this, this city as well as the other cities in the county to act upon. San Mateo County released a request for proposals for animal care, control, and sheltering services uh, in January of 2021, and so all of these uh, negotiations happened uh, for the most part during uh, COVID-19, and we uh, held negotiations remotely with the vendor. Uh, and those negotiations began in March of 2021 with Peninsula Humane Society. Uh, there, the RFP was sent to 70 vendors, uh, as is, was noted in the staff report. The county did receive two proposals, and PHS was a successful bidder. Uh, the proposed agreement, again, runs for five years, the total amount of the agreement is $32.5 million. 
Uh, I know this next chart may be a little small for those at, at home, but I'll, I'll go through it really quickly. Uh, in total, the annual cost for countywide is $6.2 uh, million, and by the five-year number will raise to just under $6.9 million. And you do that math for each year, and, and you get $32.5 million. Uh, it is broken up in detail here on personnel fringe, which is all the wraparound uh, costs related to personnel uh, benefits, uh, as well as uh, other personnel expenditures, operating expenses, equipment, subcontracts, and other costs. It's important to note the structure of the agreement. And so the county holds a contract with the vendor, and then these all 20 cities have a contract with the county. All, ni all 19 cities have a, have a contract uh, with the county. And so that contract covers uh, the cost, services, our responsibilities to pay for the debt on the facility, as well as performance expe expectations. Uh, the county is directly responsible for oversight of animal control, uh, and that is uh, uh, Lori's job, which is why she's here today if you have any questions uh, about uh, the, the contract or operations. Uh, with the provision of the contract, I, I think I've said all, 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 all of these, but it's important to note that the new contract has built-in incentives. Uh, there is an annual incentive of up to $100,000, uh, and there are thresholds uh, for the vendor to actually, if they meet their performance targets, uh, to receive the, that financial incentive, but that financial incentive is put right back in uh, to helping animals in our community. Uh, also within the contract are increased uh, response times and a number of benefits. So the, the staff report has a list of services that nearly uh, covers a full page, and, and so it's on page 207 of the staff report, and I won't go through them all, but this little word cloud uh, shows, uh, shows a number of them. So the contract covers rescuing animals, uh, capturing large stray animals, investigations of animal bites and attacks, removal of dead animals from public property, removal of dead wildlife from private property, enforcement of lease laws and local ordinances, pickup of animals that are injured uh, or in confined spaces such as schools, uh, response to calls for animals in traffic, dangerous, uh, dangerous animal permit violations, straight patrol requests, uh, as well as treatment services for inter injured animals, and it provides animal enrichment uh, services wh while at the shelter, and, and there's a whole list in, in the staff report. It's also important to note that the agreement that you have before you has a number of services that were not in the prior contract. And so those are listed on page four of seven in your staff report. And just to highlight a few, one, uh, there's a requirement for an annual uh, fiscal or performance audit in the contract, that is new. There is also uh, 26 performance measures in the contract that the vendor must meet. That covers both response times, staffing, uh, as, well, as well as service uh, and care for the animals. There are also an additional four animal control officers, which is important for cities like, 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 like San Bruno because response times, frankly, ha ha have been an issue. And so the new contract has uh, additional officers as well as response time performance measures that, that the vendor is required to meet. It's also worth noting that because Peninsula Humane Society operates a non, a philanthropic wing, they provide services that the cities do not have to pay for. Uh, that's adoption. Microchipping is 100% covered uh, for animals that are, that are adopted by their philanthropic wing, uh, as well as uh, paying for spay and neuter. And so because um, of the partnership that uh, PHS has with, with donors, uh, all of the cities in the county actually receive benefits uh, through their philanthropic efforts. And so the cost is divided up by uh, all agencies in the county. Uh, Sam Bruno, as shown on the slide, pays 5.71% of that total cost. And next fiscal year, our estimated total is $376,000. 
Uh, the cost is included in the proposed budget that will be before you. It's also worth noting that uh, for, for council members uh, that have uh, paid attention to the, the budget in detail, this cost was budgeted in the police department. We have now pulled that out and put that in non-departmental. Uh, while the police department does uh, work closely with PHS, they are not responsible for the contract um, negotiations nor costs. And, and so that is handled by the city administrator's office. And so we put it in, in the non-departmental budget, which is a typical uh, budgeting practice. And so uh, I am available for any questions that the city council may have on uh, the contract uh, or the negotiation process and uh, uh, the county's animal control and licensing manager is also available. Thank you. And if we could uh, unshare the screen. Thank you so much and a good, uh, good evening, Mark. So any uh, uh, questions from colleagues? Uh, Council Member Mason? Yeah, thank you for that presentation. I just wanted to follow up on a question I had sent earlier uh, to staff, hope, hope we, hoping they, there would be some preparation, but around the, um, the lease. So please do correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like the lease is approximately $40,000 a year. Um, and some of this is somehow contributed to the construction of the new building. And so the question that I have is um, once that cost is so at some point realized, understanding that this is years from now, is there also an agreement that the cities that contributed would no longer be contributing to a lease? Yes. So let me take that. The $48,000 that you're referring to is a part of our annual payment. That cover, it, it's mentioned as a lease. It's actually lease revenue financing, which is the debt on the 30, nearly $30 million facility. And so that annual payment for the $28,300,000 facility is approximately uh, $856,000 a year. San Bruno's portion of that is $48,000. And so that is a um, lease revenue debt payment for 30 years. And once that debt is satisfied, we will not uh, pay towards that lease revenue payment. Okay, great. And then um, as far as the actual, um, hold on, as far as the proportionate share of costs, so I understand that it's separated by city, and I think that was really helpful, but I would love to see an actual metrics, and, and I know that this was requested in the past, but an actual metric of how many calls, um, the agreement is quite long, but there is a section in the agreement that actually lays out what the expectations are for the contractor within every area possible. And so, um, but I didn't see a metric that breaks down each one of those by city. And so while I, I am gonna support this item tonight, it, it has been requested before and I, um, I would really like to see it. I think it's important that we really understand how many calls are actually coming from San Bruno for each one of these areas, how many are being responded to so that we know what that proportionate share is going to. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to thank, um, thank the city manager for ensuring that this contract was procured um, and that we have a reasonable end date um, so that there is a competitive bidding process. Thank you. And then um, I saw that Lori's uh, mic went on. And if you had something to add, that's great as far as to that, as well as just for those listening, if you could tell on Rollins exactly where the facility is located, because some folks may be going, well, where is this? Because I know it's a beautiful location, and uh, you can adopt and, and all kinds of volunteer, all kinds of stuff. There's actually two shelters. Uh, first, I want to say thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor and council members. Uh, the county shelter is at 12th Airport Boulevard, right on the bay. It's right next to Coyote Point Golf Course. Uh, the Humane Society, the nonprofit, has one also in Burlingame on Rollins Road, and that's where the adoptions take place. And the shelter is completely finished and constructed, and Again, when COVID's over, if anybody would like a tour, I'd be more than happy to take everybody through the shelter. It's a beautiful building. 
I'm just trying to get a puppy. Um, yeah. So, um, <laughs> uh, was there anything else to add to Council Member uh, Mason's uh, in regards to numbers? Or uh, I can turn that to City Manager. I know you were on the ad hoc committee for City Manager. No, I, I, I can answer the question about the reports. And I do want to thank uh, City Manager Javon. He was amazing on the negotiating team. Um, he asked very good questions uh, and participated and helped us negotiate a contract which is less than what we currently pay today so thank you very much um, yes we will be receiving monthly reports quarterly reports and annual reports those reports can be broken down uh, by city uh, by calls that are responded to in your city if you'd like to see the ones currently I can send those over to the city manager so you can see what your current statistics are and then going forward I will be sending them over monthly but we Thank can you. report out on that. And if there's anything else you want to see when you see the reports, let me know, and we can uh, try to get those for you. Thank you, uh, City Manager. Anything to add, or that was took care of it. Took care of it. Okay. Other other questions from colleagues? Uh, Council Member Salazar. Just a quick comment. I also wanted to add some thanks to the City Manager for all of his work on this. I know he he did put in a lot of time on, in getting all this together. Um, you know, what the services that the Peninsula Humane Society provide are, uh, a lot of people don't realize that, you know, all the things that they do, and it's one of those things you don't appreciate until you actually need to call for their assistance, and then you, you realize how uh, how important it is to have that. And so, um, you know, I, I uh, visited both facilities. Uh, the, the building on Rawlings Road is definitely very impressive. Uh, I took my puppy there a while back to get some counseling uh, when she was young, and so, um, definitely appreciate their services and everything that they're doing and um, I, I'm glad to see this contract coming forward and we can we can hear the dog uh, now uh, uh, council member Hamilton uh, actually uh, council member Salazar's uh, comment was almost exactly what I was going to say because it's all, all all the same stuff very appreciative of the, the of, uh, our, our city manager and and staff putting together this this process um, this was all brand new to me how this all works and the 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 way that the um, that the costs are shared and the, the formula used to come up with the share for each city is logical and fair um, and I also would echo uh, the recommendation that folks uh, visit these these beautiful facilities um, we uh, we got our cat we adopted our cat from there um, we've, who's been a, a guest uh, unwanted guest in, in some of our meetings and, uh, and Penny sleeping there in the background took uh, obedience lessons in, the, in that beautiful facility. So I highly recommend um, uh, folks visit it. Um, and I'm, I'm very supportive of this action tonight. Anything else from my colleagues? Uh, I, I'm gonna, I have something, but uh, city manager? Yeah, so uh, at the risk of bringing up something new, uh, just before walking up here, uh, I got a note that a press release will be released uh, soon tonight about a mountain lion incident that we had in San Bruno. Uh, and it's uh, apropos to what we're discussing because uh, PHS will help out uh, with mountain lion sightings. And uh, when an officer is there, uh, it was a, a, a key part of our discussions. Uh, they will respond and they have to respond to immediately. It is a priority on call. And so we did have a mountain lion incident last night where a mountain lion actually uh, broke into a residence. Um, and so, um, Thankfully, no one was harmed, uh, but, but we do know that we have wildlife issues. And while those are under the jurisdiction of uh, the California Department of Fish and Game, uh, this contract and uh, the support from uh, Peninsula uh, Humane Society and their uh, animal control officers is a part of our immediate response force uh, on these instances uh, where if there is a a dangerous situation and someone uh, and an animal needs to be um, uh, tranquilized. Uh, they, 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 they have that uh, ability and, and can advise. So uh, know that uh, this is an important um, uh, contract and, and thank the, the council and, and thank Lori for all of her work. Um, and, and we know uh, many of our neighboring uh, communities are experiencing uh, that as you watch on the news, not just here but uh, elsewhere as well. This is one of our initiatives, but obviously it was being worked on. This is one of my concerns because um, though we've had reports available to us, uh, maybe we just haven't looked or asked, uh, but at the same time with this new agreement, 
Uh, I like the uh, other elements that have been added. Of course, the costs and the service level are always been things that we sometimes have heard or not being able to get it within a timely fashion or they're just too busy. So I appreciate the items that have been added in. Um, I do also want to thank the, the city manager for his time as well as the other uh, folks. I, I know it wasn't just you, but I know there were others, but you were there uh, from uh, starting it, finishing it. And so I think that we're finding ourselves in a better spot uh, than we were. So I want to um, thank everyone for that. And final comments from Ms. Uh, Marty uh, Medina. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just wanted to uh, thank everyone for their work on this. As for the mountain lion, is there a phone number that is operable at late at night? Is there what's that phone number that people should call? Because um, I'm hearing from more residents and seeing it on next door or Facebook of uh, more sightings. And maybe that's because there's so many cameras that we have out. But um, what number should someone call? There's a, num there's a number, 911. Uh, call 911 if uh, a animal, uh, whether it's a mountain lion or other, is posing a risk. Uh, our officers will come out and assess. They do have the ability to contact California Fish and Game, uh, our Peninsula Humane Society, as well as the Puma Project that tracks and tags most of the mountain lions uh, in our area. And so they have immediate access to them uh, to, to uh, assess uh, if they're tagged. Uh, and, and where that mountain lion may be if it is tagged. And so 911 is the number that people should call. Okay. Uh, Council Member Hamilton. Quick follow up to that. If it's not a life threatening sighting, you know, if so if I, I spot a mountain lion on my camera from the night before, should we call the business line for that? So for a dangerous animal, you call 911. Uh, uh, Even after the fact. You can call the non-emergency line to report it. Uh, there are also other numbers that I'll, I'll hand. I don't have, Lori may, Lori may have them, but we can certainly provide those. And I know staff is working on uh, mountain line communications to the general public that will provide uh, a whole host of resources to the community, uh, given the, the prevalence that we're having, as we all know, uh, largely due to the fires uh, and mountain lions being driven out of, out of, out of their habitat. Uh, and one of the things I was able to learn is we live in a woozy area. Um, uh, which is the urban wildlife uh, interface. And mountain lion sightings are normal. It is a part of where we live. Uh, and so now that everyone has green cameras, uh, you are seeing mountain lions when you live really close on that urban wild, wildlife interface that unfortunately is a part of nature. Uh, but um, there, there are instances where uh, absolutely you call 911 and there, there are places to report mountain lion sightings and we will make sure that those are provided. Thank you. Okay. Uh, information is coming out. Uh, again, uh, I want to uh, thank you for your time. I know you're making the uh, county rounds. And uh, obviously, thanks to uh, Mr. Hamilton and Mr. Salazar, we've even got a plug for the services that are provided uh, for uh, everybody's interest. So uh, with that, thank you. And then we'll bring it back to Council for Action on item C, please. I'd like to make a motion. I'll second it. Uh, motion to Hamilton, second and Salazar uh, to introduce the resolution to authorize the city manager to execute the agreement with the county of San Mateo uh, for the continued provision of animal controlled services for five year term beginning July 1, 2021. Roll call, please. Council Member Hamilton? Aye. Council Member Mason? Aye. Council Member Salazar? Aye. Vice Mayor Marty Medina? Aye. Mayor Rico Medina? Again, thank you, Lori, and good luck, and uh, enjoy the rest of your week. All right. Uh, thank you. And so we will uh, go back. Uh, we're still on conduct of business, but let's go back to item A and read that quickly. And again, as you know, that was received the third quarter financial update report for 2020 21 as of March 31st, 2021. I adopt a resolution approving the third quarter budget amendment for. Uh, fiscal year 2020-21, operating and capital budget. I'll turn it over to the city manager and then the finance director. And again, if we could um, hold our questions until the end of the presentation. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mayor um, and members of the Council. Um, my name is Chen Yu Sun. I'm the Finance Director for the City of Bruno. And today I'm going to present the third quarter financial update for this uh, fiscal year, fiscal year 2021. Okay. Um, the objective of this presentation is ask the Council to receive the third quarter financial update report as of March 31st, 2021. There is no action need to be taken taken at the, tonight and then second item need some um, action from the council to adopt the resolution amending the fiscal year 2021 operating and capital improvement budget by approving the budget amendments uh, the agenda today includes the general fund budget overview the third quarter financial projections and and the the city manager is going to come up to, to discuss, to provide a budget preview for the next fiscal year 2021-22, and in the end, the council will discuss and deliberate. Um, and again, what we're going to talk about quarter, third quarter of this fiscal year, which starts from January 2021 and in March 2021. Um, here is the general fund budget overview. Um, if you do remember, uh, and when the current year budget was adopted, uh, we're estimating a 48.7 million in revenues for the general fund and 49.3 million in expenditures. So we had asked the council permission to use $591,000 for um, of the fund, general fund balance to cover the shortfall. Uh, here is a look of the general fund revenue summary and expenditures. Uh, general fund revenue is relatively diversified, and 25% of the general fund revenue came from property tax, and then uh, the, another uh, transfers, and then other revenues account about 21% of the general fund revenue, revenue that's the second largest item. The third one is sales tax by 13%. Expenditure side, were not so diversified, and most of our expenditures are coming from uh, staffing-related costs. By department, uh, safety means police and fire departments account over 47% of the uh, general fund expenditures. Um, here's the third quarter general fund update. Um, um, as of general, as of March 31st, we are looking at the entire in, in we estimate as of year end, we'll receive about $50 million in revenue for general fund, and then just around $48 million in expenditures operationalized. And we're actually going to see a uh, way with operational activity. We're going to see about a million dollar in surplus this year. And we'll end the year with a fund balance of two point, almost $2.4 million. Um, here is a look at the general fund fund revenue for this fiscal year. Um, we did amend the, the general fund revenue um, by making several cuts. And I'll talk about cuts in a few minutes later. So as of, as of right now, we're anticipating the amended budget uh, the, the the revenue will exceed the amended budget by two hundred eighty six thousand dollars, but that's a space that's is based on the the decreased amended budget. There are some cuts involved in the amended budget is vehicle license tax. We cut the vehicle license tax uh, revenue projection by six hundred twenty one thousand dollars because more schools in the county are converting from non-basic schools to uh, basic schools, and then they are reduced the funding resource for vehicle license fees. We we'll also see a decrease in the sales tax receipt. Sales tax will be done by another $350,000, and departmental revenues are uh, also done by uh, $377,000. Um, to come up for, to make, um, for some of the loss in revenue, charge for services and transfer other funds are going to exceed the amended budget by 1.5 million. So that's kind of put us a little bit in the good. Um, Expenditure-wise, um, the city staff has exercised proactive spending controls 
Um, and now we will end, end the year with expenditure about 1.2 million below the amended budget. Uh, expenditure savings are mostly associated with the position vacancy and delayed recruitment. Um, social restrictions imposed by coronavirus have caused some of service reductions specifically related to uh, um, community service department. They had to cut a lot of programs because of the social distancing mandate. mandate. Here is a look at enterprise and internal service fund budget update. Um, enterprise funds, uh, as of the third quarter of this year, the revenues and the expenditure receipts are mostly on par uh, as the previous year. Um, one, one thing I want to talk about is the city net and city net for the year end estimate, they're going to receive about 9.4 million in revenues. Expenditures is going to be $9.7 million. That expenditure includes the debt service items. Um, operational wise, the city net is actually going to break uh, about break even, meaning their operating operating management revenues will closely tag to their operating ex expenditures. However, there is no uh, extra funding provided for their debt service, which is related with the router debt, and it's about three hundred fifty thousand dollars. That's why that you are going to see at the year end that they are going to look at a, a debt, another additional deficit is three hundred two thousand dollars. Um, there are some uh, improvements in this and uh, some uh, budget control effort made in the city that I think we should applaud for them, given their. A very difficult financial situation. The TV content expense has been reduced by almost 800,000. Uh, they invested additional 115,000 in equipment replacement, IP TV platform, and limited fiber bills. Um, the revenue gap is really caused by some delinquencies. Um, they have lost, the city now lost revenue from about 250, um, 50, 200. 250 service counts every month, and um, you know throughout the year they serve about a total of 700, 7,000 homes. That it's actually equal to 7,000 7, accounts. Um, they have increased, proposed uh, some increase in the average revenue per user. Um, it was approved, and um, the the approved target was $120 per month, but in reality they're only able to. Um, collect about $109 a month, so there's a $10 difference. And there is a sub substantial amount of delinquency build out, which is really created quite a bit of drag on the revenue for sitting out and size funds. So um, there, um, the, the, they have some uh, budget management measures, which is include the delinquent account collection efforts, and the service downgrades, they're not disconnecting any of those of their accounts. They have just-in-time inventory replenish replenishment and the equipment management policy. They also intend to equalize expenditure with operating revenues, and now we have seen them done that, making a valiant effort try to equalize their uh, expenditure and operating revenues. Um, uh, here is a look at the city's uh, uh, internal service funds as of, um, as of March 31st and throughout the year, um, we're expecting to the internal service funds to be on par with the previous year and the internal service fund is mostly uh, funded by the city departments. Uh, all departments can contribute to the, system, to the internal service funds um, to make it a whole and then try to maintain a certain level of fund balance for those funds. So we, there is no issue there. Um, there are some of budget amendment requests, and the total amendment request accounts about $242,000. So with that, that ends my part for the third quarter uh, financial update, and now and the lesson to the city manager for the budget preview. Thank you, thank you, Kim. You, uh, 
I want to begin by thanking Ken Yu, who started uh, in March and immediately uh, began our budget uh, development process uh, and, and, and really uh, jumped right in. And so uh, my job right, right now is to give you a quick up overview of next year's budget. Uh, I will just recap for council. What you heard was the third quarter update um, for the current fiscal year. Uh, know that um, um, the, the fact that we're ending a little uh, uh, up in the general fund is a reflection of we cut and we cut deeply uh, and, uh, and expenditures um, in the general fund have been uh, th throttled back and, and so we're ending with um, uh, not spending uh, approximately uh, 1.2 million dollars uh, of the of the adopted expenditures, which is great news, and that's the the constantly uh, moderating expenditures uh, as best as we can. But just a quick uh, highlight of the coming fiscal year. So fiscal year 2021 uh, for the public, uh, we operate on a July 1 to June 30 fiscal year, uh, and uh, what's before you is a highlight of the general fund. Uh, preliminary budget, uh, which shows that uh, with using the fund balance uh, that we have uh, projected at the end of the year, uh, revenues are 4.9, uh, 49.7 million, expenditures are projected at 51.1 million, and so that leaves a deficit of 1.4, and, and in utilizing the money within, within fund balance, uh, the 2.3, that leaves the remaining fund balance of uh, 0.9 a million or, or roughly 900,000. Uh, but what that does is that takes us under our policy target to have a $1.5 million fund balance uh, in the general fund at budget adoption. And so we will need to transfer in $600,000 to make that policy limit. Uh, I will say, and I know that the city council knows this, this is a highlight. Uh, at the end of this week, uh, you will receive your proposed budget uh, from the city. And then in June, we will set about a host of study sessions and public hearings on the budget. So this is just a quick highlight, uh, as you know. What's also important to note on this slide is we and all other municipalities in the country, frankly, have um, the American Rescue Act funds that were meant to provide resources to cities like ours that have lost revenue uh, due to COVID-19. And we know that our annual revenue is off more than $5 million, uh, due to COVID-19. And so that revenue number would be a lot higher. And with expenditures at 51, uh, without COVID-19, we wouldn't have this deficit, the deficit. Uh, because we, we cut deeply. And, and uh, in this baseline budget, uh, we are not projecting to return all of uh, those expenditures that uh, were cut from the budget. So yes, we still have a challenge. Yes, through the budget. Uh, we will talk about how we apply that American Rescue Act funds, which is $8 million that, that have to be spent uh, between uh, over the next, I think, three and a half years. It's by uh, December 31st, 2024. And so that money was meant to uh, restore a portion of the funds that cities have lost. And so we will uh, be proposing to use a portion of those funds to help out our 2021 budget because we will still have a deficit uh, because our revenues will not be back at pre-pandemic levels. Other funds, just to highlight um, our, our water and wastewater or sewer fund are in good standing. Uh, and as the city council knows, uh, you um, uh, cancel the 5% rate increases on those funds uh, because those funds uh, are, in, are in good status and, and can do without uh, those rate increases this year. Uh, CityNet, uh, as our finance director mentioned, uh, has actually done a great job to throttle back their expenditures uh, due to loss of in, in, in both customer base and loss in revenue due to non-payment. Uh, and they're projected to end next year uh, and uh, the current year with rent operating expenditures and uh, operating revenues being, uh, if not even, uh, very, very close to even. The challenge is that they are not able to pay uh, the money that is owed to the general fund, uh, and that is both for the annual debt service and the annual fund deficit. I will say on city net that um, the city council knows we will uh, continue to talk about strategies for CNET as an enterprise and as an operation. As you know, your auditor recommended that we undertake a uh, 
a third party study of the city net business plan. Uh, we are getting ready to release an RFP for that. Uh, and we will continue to talk about strategies uh, for, for, for city net. Uh, and as, uh, again, as the council knows, um, the first thing that, that, that we've done is really renegotiated a number of contracts and, and, and brought expenditures uh, as, as close to revenue as possible. Stormwater, um, as, uh, as the public knows, we have a current storm and drainage and flood protection fee uh, that is going through a Prop 218 property owner election now. Uh, that fund uh, will enter into the negative uh, by approximately $1 million next year. And so should that uh, property Prop 218 election fail, uh, we, we will need to address that $1 million. And those are expenditures that are planned for our stormwater system in 2021. And so we will have some tough decisions to make. Either we will throttle back expenditures uh, and decrease maintenance uh, and service on our stormwater system, or we'll supplement that from the general fund. And what you've seen in this prior slide is the general fund uh, is ending with fund balance of one point uh, of point nine million dollars, uh, and so to balance the general uh, the general fund, we will be using ARA funds, and so um, we will uh, begin to enter into a deficit position in stormwater, and we will, uh, if if the current measure doesn't pass, uh, make some tough decisions on on what we do with our with with our stormwater system. Uh, now, this does not include um, our reserves. The city does have reserves. Uh, I just want to point out that uh, what we're talking about here is operating, uh, and, and that's important for the public to know. We're talking about operating funds, not reserve funds. Uh, but stormwater um, will be entering into an ongoing deficit position um, uh, subject to approval of the fee, and so uh, uh, we, we would not want to burn our reserve funds on that, uh, but we will have to throttle back those expenditures or uh, find some way to uh, cover those funds. So... Uh, well, you have received the third quarter update. There's no action with regard to that update. It is just uh, a reporting out. Uh, there, there is one action, adopt a resolution amending the uh, operating and capital budget by approving the budget amendments uh, as required. But that concludes our presentation. Again, uh, the proposed budget is due out at the end of this week. And then the city council will have uh, budget deliberations and discussions beginning in the month of June uh, with adoption plan for uh, your last meeting in June in order for next year's budget to take effect on July 1. Thank you. Thank you to uh, the finance director and the city manager for the presentation. And I'd like to um, bring it to council for uh, questions on the presentation. Uh, Vice Mayor Medina. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, first question, slide 16, regarding the insurance. Um, seeing the expenditure at 90% of budget, do we, do we have, um, maybe we can have a couple comments on, on that number being so high, is that expected to be at this point or, or what's happening there? That's, do you want a number of questions, Mr. Mayor, or do you want one at, one at a time? Uh, great, great point. Uh, City Manager, Finance Director, what, what would you prefer? Uh, it would be nice to have all the questions uh, from each individual council member at one time, and then we will address them uh, 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 after each council member. Perfect. All right, uh, Vice Mayor, continue. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, for the non-payment in city net services, how much? How much is the non-payment, and um, that that would be eligible for ARA uh, funding? The last question is um, for the ARA funding. How much is it over the number of years? If we can get a breakdown, I had somebody ask me the other day, and. Uh, I want to make sure we're after it and answering it. Thank you. Any other colleagues uh, with questions? We'll, we'll put them all forward. Uh, uh, Councilmember Mason, please. Sure. No, I'm so sorry, City Manager, I thought you wanted all the questions first. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I, I may not have heard. 
not been clear. I think we can answer council members in the DNS question and then go to the next council member. Okay, so we'll take a council member at a time. So uh, thank you, city manager, for the clarification, and we'll uh, for your and we'll look forward to your responses. Sure. So uh, let's uh, begin with with the last course question and then uh, go up. How much revenue is the city receiving from the American Rescue Act? It is eight million dollars that has to be spent uh, by December thirty first, twenty twenty four. Uh, the, the next uh, question was, how much is the city net non-payment amount, and how much uh, can be used uh, from the ARA funds? So uh, while we look for the non-payment amount, it is important to note that we will have those discussions at budget time. Uh, the staff will not be recommending that we cover utility non-payments, whether it is city net, water or water, sewer, or garbage charges through ARA funds. There are other state and federal funds that help customers pay utility accounts. And so we will be reaching out to our customers with delinquent utility accounts and providing them with the information where they can apply to the state program first uh, for uh, uh, to participate uh, if they meet the, the criteria so that the, those utility bills can be paid. And, and so that's first step be, before we use the ARA funds to cover delinquent utility bills. The city net director informed me that the delinquent amount is roughly about $25,000 a month. So we're estimating they're losing about three hundred thousand dollars a year in revenue from customers. Yes, it, 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 it's important to note though that the loss of revenue does not dollar for dollar translate into um, a, a delta between revenue and expenditures. So if a customer bill is eighty dollars and they don't pay that eighty dollars. There's a, a portion of that that is hard cost to the city. And so just know that a $300,000 loss in revenues is not necessarily a gap of $300,000 uh, to the inter to the enterprise revenues over expenditures. Um, regarding the insurance question, that's the part that I am not sure, sure uh, where you're looking at the high percentage. So for insurance, as of March 31st, uh, we received 75% of the budgeted revenues. We spend about 77% of the budgeted expenditures. The 98% was actually from last year. Got it. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Last follow-up question, Mr. Mayor. Sure. Please, Mr. Vice Mayor. Um, the ARA money is there a limit how much could be spent per year or the limit is just it has to be spent by 2024? There is no limit on how much can be spent per year. However, ARA will be paid out in two installments, uh, half in, um, um, in June 21 this year and the other half one year from then. There, there are uh, tons of regulations uh, around expenditures and use of ARA money. We'll, we'll cover that during budget. The U.S. Treasury uh, is uh, continuing to come out with uh, regulations and clarifications of ARA expenditures, uh, and we will certainly handle all of that uh, through our budget process. Thank you. Real, real quick, and then we're going to go to Councilmember Mason on the ARA. I understood that too, two installments like you said. And is it that they don't have to be spent, but they have to be obligated by, as you said, December 31st, 2024? And does that hold true for the second amount or does that go to 2026? The newly issued Treasury Department guidance said that uh, we need to obligate the provided the appropriate money by December 31st, 2024, but we shouldn't spend all of that by 
by December 31st, 2026. Okay, thank you. Just since we were on the top, I wanted to clarify. Uh, Councilmember Mason. Thank you. So I did want to just ask um, some questions around the starting with the hotel uh, occupancy tax. I know that in the question I asked earlier and staff has responded to around the short-term rentals that this is going to be coming back to us at a later time. Um, but what, what I think just at this time, what is the status? It, it does feel like we are losing money. Um, I do see people staying at Airbnbs. Uh, there are numerous articles that say that Airbnb has um, has done well during COVID, um, shockingly, um, given that people aren't traveling as much. And so I am curious to know, you know, exactly where where are we really with this uh, with this item? Uh, and then, uh, uh, I ask all of them. Uh, yeah. Do you mind? Yep. No, no Thanks. problem. Um, the other one is a question that has also been asked in the past. So if this could be answered more effectively, I think at the next um, budget meeting, it would be really helpful uh, to really understand uh, the card room tax and whether there are any other taxes that are coming um, from uh, Artichoke Joe's and whether what those are in comparison to other cities. So that doesn't have to be answered today, but I, I think that should be answered at the next meeting, at the next um, budget meeting. Um, because in the report, there aren't any financial numbers, and I, that staff did provide that to us in an email uh, later, but I do think it's important that we really have a better understanding of how these taxes uh, at Artichoke Joe's contribute to our funds. Um, there was a section on internal service funds. And I think the question really around the internal service funds is if the city has been, um, many of the buildings within the city services have been closed over the past year, then what are the fees associated with? Understanding that we've had some emergency services like fire and police that are open, um, and understanding that people may have been reporting, like maintenance workers may have been reporting to work, uh, I'm just trying to figure out what are the maintenance concerns that have arisen if workers or buildings were close to the public over the past year. Um, and I think that is my last question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, city manager? So let's begin with the uh, short-term uh, rental regulations. So uh, the city council uh, did approximately a year ago uh, establish um, a short-term rental ordinance uh, which apply our TLT transient occupancy tax to short-term rentals. Uh, staff uh, has been working on implementing that. Um, as the city council knows, the, the two departments that are chiefly responsible for implementing the short-term rental both the finance department and the community and economic development department. That project was being led by those department directors. Uh, over the last year, both of those department directors uh, separated from the city, Chinyu, the current finance director, beginning in March, uh, and the uh, ec community and economic development director uh, beginning uh, approximately uh, five months ago. And so implementation of the short-term rental ordinance is a staff work item. Um, it is being supported by the city attorney's office. Uh, staff, staff is working with uh, both the online platforms as well as communicating with HDL, which we recently entered into a contract with for, um, for processing of our business license taxes. They may take over short-term rental um, um, tax implementation. We are having those discussions now at this moment. I'm not able to give the city council a precise um, deadline on when that will be implemented, just so that it is on staff's work program. And the question that we responded to today, we did commit uh, to providing you with an update at a later time. So I just don't want to provide um, a date now without uh, checking in uh, with, with, with all of the staff that are working on that project. Uh, with regard to the card room tax, uh, duly noted, and we will uh, to discuss that uh, during the budgetary process. Uh, sure. Um, so, um, Council Member Mason, we 
um, although our gap before didn't address any number, didn't say any number uh, regarding the carbon tax, there is an attachment to the staff report called attachment two. And in that, um, each uh, major revenue items are listed and the carbon tax is listed as uh, midway in the revenue section. For the year, we estimated we received about $2 million from carbon tax. That's based, that estimated based on 38 tables. We just recently received uh, a notice from the uh, party of Joe's owner that he wants to increase the number of tables from 38 to 43, effective June 1. So next fiscal year, we are anticipating a little bit more revenue from uh, from carbon. But that's the summary for this year. Um, I don't have the answer to comparing to other cities that we can do more research on that, but each city is different. It, every city has a different kind of a car room situation. Uh, some city may have more and some city may have less, um, but that's all I, I can't find more and provide the couple additional information. Thank you. <laughs> Just on uh, the card room, my understanding is every July 1, based on the CPI, that there is an automatic increase that occurs for the uh, card room table tax, I'll call it a table tax, which is a quarterly, uh, based on numbers of tables that are authorized, uh, which go in groups of four. So at current, to it decreasing to that would then go to the next level of more monies per table uh, for all of those because it goes into another tier. Is that correct? That's correct. In addition, uh, our card room tax is charged on a per table basis, uh, which uh, was actually more advantageous than um, some other uh, neighboring cities with card rooms that have a revenue-based tax. So, for example, during COVID-19, we did not lose um, card room revenue because it was based on a uh, guaranteed per table tax, uh, whereas other cities that had a revenue structure based on revenue had a significant decrease in, in their card room revenue. But again, uh, we will talk about that uh, during budget and, and can come back with, with more information and a more uh, in-depth discussion. Other uh, council member questions? Uh, Mr. Mayor, I think there was one more question oh, about sorry. The service funds. Uh, so council member Mason uh, asked a question about internal service funds and were there any savings uh, as a result of municipal facilities uh, being closed during uh, the pandemic uh, and uh, some employees working remotely. And so at a high level answer, uh, there are no significant savings uh, in internal service funds due to COVID-19. It's important to note that our internal service funds are uh, building maintenance, fleet, and uh, IT services. Uh, with regard to I, IT, IT uh, was fully functional during the pandemic, if not more so. Uh, with with regard to um, a build, building maintenance, uh, there were no significant appreciable uh, changes in their in the, the cost of their operations due to COVID-19. It's also important to note that why while, while some of our facilities were closed to the public. Uh, Many of um, our employees were actually on work or on rotational schedules. And so City Hall uh, was, was actually not, not closed during the pandemic uh, and, and, and was very much uh, a place of work. And uh, not just police and fire staff, but uh, staff from our, our HR division, our finance division, as well as uh, both the public works and community and economic development counters for the most part uh, were, were, were open and accepting um, of, uh, of customers uh, that, that made appointments and uh, uh, they were uh, employees that were on site for processing uh, and employees were on a rotational schedule. And so there, there, uh, with regard to our internal service funds, uh, we are not seeing any significant savings due to the pandemic. Thanks. Uh, other uh, questions from colleagues? Uh, council member Salazar just uh, one question really quick so uh, the big um, adjustment item in in 
this uh, proposal is for the traffic engineering consultant. And I read in the staff report that initially the cost for this consultant was going to be offset by savings from an open position, uh, being that we uh, lost our, our previous traffic engineer. And uh, it also said that the position was later frozen, and then so I guess the fund the funding went away, and now we need an additional um, source of funds to to um, uh, obtain the consultant. And so I just kind of I wanted to hear sort of the the, the process. Was there at one time was it decided that we didn't need the position, and therefore it was it was frozen, or how how did we get to the point where we went to having an offset to not having it and needing it again. Sure. Uh, thank you, Council Member Salazar, for that question. Uh, the answer is actually multi-part. So, uh, yes, we uh, had a traffic engineer uh, that separated the, from the city to take uh, a job at another agency. That position was vacant when we developed this current year budget for 2020, 20, for the 2021 fiscal year. It was envisioned that that position would stay vacant because we had an open recruitment and continued to recruit for that position. However, what uh, the, the council and I, I, I know our, our employees remember is that when we adopted the 2021 budget, we had a fiscal shortfall that we were attempting to cover through uh, employee retirements or um, employees um, uh, potentially layoffs. And so at the last minute, we had a number of employees, uh, long tenure, that elected to retire. What they did was they, in effect, saved a, a position that was slated to be laid off. And so toward the beginning of the fiscal year, there was an all-out effort to avoid layoffs. And so we essentially froze every vacant position uh, in order to avoid uh, having an, an employee laid off. One of those vacant positions was the city engineer position. We continued to recruit for that position uh, and hire a contractor to fill in for that work. And we used professional services money that we had to pay for that, that contractor. One of the challenges is a contract traffic engineer is more expensive than an employee contract, uh, contract uh, than an employee traffic engineer. And so this is one of those um, interesting positions where when we have a vacancy, it actually costs us more money. Uh, because the contractor uh, uh, in, in this market uh, makes more than uh, what uh, we, we pay to in, in employ a position. We have been unsuccessful in our recruitment of a traffic engineer, and that is still an open position that we are still recruiting for. Uh, we are doing an assessment and may have to uh, take a look at our long-term strategy for filling that position. Finding traffic engineers um, in the Bay Area, on the peninsula, uh, and at our compensation level uh, is, ex is, a, is extremely challenging. And so, uh, unfortunately, that work uh, doesn't go away and, and much of it is mandated. And so we will continue to have to contract for that work at a higher cost. Okay. Yeah, thank you for, for uh, reminding us of, of uh, all of those uh, events that transpired. And, and so if, if we were uh, eventually to be successful in filling that position, then uh, these funds could be then transferred to cover the, the salary of the, of the FTE yes. going forward. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Any other uh, questions from colleagues? Thank you, Mr. Hamilton. And I had a similar question that Council Member Salazar just asked, so um, that the detail helped me kind of understand it better, too. Um, so at this time, if there are any members of the public that wish to speak on this topic, um, please raise your virtual hand. We'll give it a moment. And again, this is on the third qu uh, quarter financial update report. seeing any, I'll bring it back to council uh, for any action um, um, regarding um, the, uh, uh, if we wish to take action and adopt a resolution. Through the chair, I'll make a motion to approve the resolution uh, making the budget 
adjustments? Oh, second. Um, <laughs> motion, made, motion made and seconded. Uh, roll call, please. Councilmember Hamilton? Aye. Councilmember Mason? Aye. Councilmember Salazar? Aye. Vice Mayor Marty Medina? Aye. Mayor Rico Medina? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Um, now we'll move to item uh, under uh, business item B, please. Item 6B, adopt a resolution authorizing the city manager to vote on behalf of the city in the storm drainage and flood protection fee property owner mail ballot election. And uh, I'm going to pause because I do see a hand up, but I don't know if it was for the third quarter budget or if it's for this topic. So uh, maybe we can check really quick. Um, I didn't see the hand prior to the announcement of this topic, but can we just double check? Sure. Um, Paul Wapensky? Yes, yeah, for this topic. Okay. Well, okay. We'll, we'll get the report and then we'll um, come and call up, uh, upon you. Thank you. Uh, city Manager. Or I will share the screen for a brief presentation. Are so many presentations left. Okay. All right. Uh, we have a brief four slide presentation. Uh, and so, as our very last item on the agenda, I will not be long. Uh, as the city council knows, on April 6th, uh, you directed, um, you adopted a resolution submitting a storm drain, a storm drainage and flood protection fee to all property owners in the city in a uh, Prop 218 Mellon ballot election. Uh, with that process, all property owners within the city will be assessed uh, the proposed fee and uh, have been mailed a ballot. That includes the city. Uh, it also includes all, all private parties, all public agencies, uh, any school district property, county property, uh, any property owned by nonprofits or religious organizations. And so uh, every property owner, whether you are a natural person uh, or a a corporation or a public entity uh, votes in a property-based election. This is distinctly different than a county election that we are more familiar with, with when only natural uh, persons can vote. Uh, and so the item before you is to uh, essentially provide direction to the city manager on voting on city properties uh, by the required June 15th deadline. Uh, as the staff report notes, this is not a, un a uh, uncommon occurrence. The city of Burlingame who had their uh, stormwater fee in 2019 uh, voted on their 95 parcels. And so the city of San Bruno uh, owns 103 parcels uh, for uh, various facilities, things like our civic center, our courtyards, our recreation facilities, fire stations, parking lots, parks, uh, open space, our footpaths, our city net operations, utility infrastructure, whether that's a water tank, a pump station, a well station, or our city net uh, head in. And many of these properties are in residential neighborhoods. Um, for example, the facility that we have at uh, 590 Maple, the, the water pump station and well. Uh, and, and so the proposed fee that would apply to uh, all property owners as well as the city uh, is 0 0.0498859 uh, cent uh, per square foot of impervious surface area. Uh, and the estimated cost of our fair share uh, from the city uh, is $134,000 from various funds. Uh, and so the action that is before you tonight is to adopt resolution authorizing the city manager to vote on behalf of the city uh, on this storm drainage uh, and flood protection fee, property owner mail-in ballot election. Uh, direction is requested. There are really two options, uh, a yes vote or an affirmative supporting the enactment of the storm drain and flood protection fee on city-owned parcels, again, re reflecting uh, the city's fair share for the parcels it owns, or no vote uh, uh, or negative, which is not supporting enactment uh, on city-owned parcels. Uh, and with that, that concludes the presentation. Uh, happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Okay, um, we do have a member of the public that was waiting, so I'd like to go to our public in case they'd like to um, have their comments and then if they needed to depart. 
So anybody from the public, this would be the opportunity in which to raise your hand and, and make your comments known. And we will, uh, City Clerk, if you can bring in, I see we have two speakers. Is Paul Lepensky? I've got um, a comment and two questions. But my comment is uh, I, I don't think the city manager should vote on behalf of uh, the city unless the council tells him how to vote. He's not an elected official. I think you guys should uh, tell him how to vote by a council vote. My two questions are, does the city get one vote or do they get 103 votes, one for each of the properties it owns? And my uh, other question, uh, I forgot to ask this the last time that uh, this came up, but uh, if you're a non-citizen property owner, do you get to vote? Those are what I have, thank you. Thank you for your uh, comments and questions. Next speaker, please. The next speaker is Aros Harmon. Hey, it's, uh, it's me, and actually Plymouth is here as well and would like to speak in a moment. Um, my understanding is that these rates haven't been, been adjusted up for I mean, almost 20 years, I mean, since the 90s. Uh, and I know uh, raising property owner fees is never a popular thing in our politics, so I really I want to thank the uh, City Council for taking responsibility here. Like, this is a really important issue with climate change. Like, we all know storms are going to become more intense over time. You know, we get drought years and then flood years. Um, so I've already submitted my ballot in favor, and uh, and I really appreciate the, the unanimity of the Council in moving this issue forwards. Thank you for your comments. Uh, next speaker. Uh, so, so this is this is Plymouth. Can I just speak directly after Aros, if that's okay? Yes, please. Okay, great. Um, hi. So, this is uh, Plymouth Ansberg speaking. Um, uh, I live with Aros in the uh, Bel Air neighborhood, which was relatively recently, since we moved here four years ago, um, assessed for flood risk, and we were found to be a flood risk. My personal property is like one block outside of that. But you know the whole, the neighborhood as a whole is is substantially in a in a, a flooded area. So I think it's really important for us to maintain um, our stormwater infrastructure to make sure that those floods are less severe if and when they happen. Um, there was a case just a few years ago where I know a neighborhood in San Jose that was like not expected to flood had this this uh, major flood when one of their um, um, drainage systems. Uh, you know, failed basically. Um, so I think it's really important to maintain our infrastructure. And so I would encourage the council to uh, vote in favor of putting our votes towards um, raising these fees. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um, I don't see any other um, speakers that so will bring it to the council. There were some questions that were raised by the first speaker. What, one I, I'll take just so you hear uh, for me and the council is, the reason this item is on the agenda is for the council to hear from the community, to have its comments and deliberation, and then to direct the city manager on how to vote. So this will come from the city council that will direct the manager how to vote. It does not give him or her or the city manager, uh, uh, Rogan, the option on how to vote. It will be directed at them. City manager, there was two other questions that were raised. <laughs> Direct, direction is requested. Um, there was a question about do uh, only natural persons, uh, are only natural persons allowed to vote? Uh, the answer is no. Corporations, uh, school districts, public entities, religious institutions. It is the property owner uh, of, of record and the representative and the uh, authorized representative for that uh, property owner. So whether it's an LLC, a corporation, etc. Uh, and it is true that the uh, current stormwater fee has not been increased in nearly uh, 30 years. I, I believe the number is 27 years uh, was the last time it, it was increased. And I think the final question was, uh, out of the 103, is that one vote for each? Which the answer would be yes, and that would be then up 103 votes. Yes, every uh, a property owner uh, received a ballot for each parcel. Uh, and so it's uh, one vote uh, for each parcel. Thank you. Um, all right, uh, Council Member Hamilton. So uh, no questions, but just a couple of comments. First, I want to thank um, uh, 
uh, staff for putting this under contract of business and not under not under consent because it's important that everything related to this um, to this uh, stormwater action be be deliberated on as openly as possible. Um, so I'm, I'm glad that we're I'm glad that we're discussing it. The um, it, it's really important to note that this process that we're following, including um, the city being able to vote to you know to vote on its own parcels, this is all part of the state mandated process for how to handle these types of increases. Um, you know there there were there were questions that came up um, uh, earlier in the process regarding you know um, that vote to public record and all of those types of things. And it, I, I just want to make, make sure that the public understands that that the, that we're not making up this process as we go. Um, that this is that this is this the the state mandated process for doing this, which includes the city being able to vote just as anyone else on every on, on each parcel. And you know, any any individual, if a one individual owns you know ten parcels within San Bruno, that individual would get ten votes in this process. It's the same. It, it's all the same. So. Um, and I just also wanted to reiterate because it didn't. It, I don't think enough enough um, emphasis was put on this on this fact that you know, that that while nobody is in favor of that, you know, no, nobody is ecstatic about having to raise a <laughs> raise um, this fee. This right now we're all paying a 1994 rate for our stormwater, and what else in your life? Are you able to pay the same price that you were paying in 1994 for this for that service? It's just not it's just not fis, fis, uh, fiscally sustainable, which is why we had to take this action. So I just wanted to make those comments. Thank you, Thank you Council Member. Any other questions or comments from colleagues? Mr. Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor. Yes. Um, this would be for our city attorney to get absolutely clear. Everything that we're doing is in compliance with the law. Um, that's the first question. <laughs> well, certainly everything relating to this item is in compliance <laughs> with the law. I think that's what you are asking. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you for that. So, yes, yeah, the, the, the answer is yes. Um, that, that's correct. We wouldn't have brought it forward to you if it, if it hadn't been. Right, right. So just to make that absolutely clear. Um, and this is really... Part of the importance, I'm, no more questions for you, city attorney. Here's my comment. The importance of this council bringing this item to the public, for the public to decide, that as, as we're all having some financial uh, uncertainty during these times, the, the risk that we will put ourselves in as we proceed going forward if this doesn't pass we already we're already seen it we're, we're not, we don't have enough money coming in from the revenues to take care of the system that we need to protect our community um, the rate of inflation from 1994 to today is 80 percent a dollar in, in cost in 1994 is $1.80. The cost of our stormwater has remained the same. The revenue that we're getting is the same. So um, I am in support of this. Um, we must be responsible. And, and I encourage everybody, everybody to vote for it. Any other questions or comments from colleagues? Uh, not seeing any other hands up, then um, we've heard from the public. Uh, I, I won't repeat because of the hour. I'll just uh, uh, concur and echo with uh, Mr. Hamilton and uh, Vice Mayor Medina. Um, um, with that said, there is a, it is a resolution. Is there any action by council? Uh, I'll, I'll make a motion. I'd like to adopt a resolution to authorizing the city manager to vote yes on behalf of the city in the storm drainage and flood protection fee property owner mail ballot election. Okay. I think uh, the vice mayor jumped in on that one. Okay, so uh, Hamilton uh, Medina, roll call please. Council member Hamilton? 
Aye. Councilman Mason? Aye. Councilmember Salazar? Aye. Vice Mayor Marty Medina? Aye. Mayor Reed Medina? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Okay, thank you, staff, for your presentation and um, the items on consent and the conduct. Now we're going to move on to uh, item number seven, comments from council members. We have three items that uh, for discussion. So uh, what, I, what I'm suggesting we do is go ahead and uh, we'll start with Councilmember Mason, then we'll go on to Vice Mayor Medina, read the topic, allow that individual council member or vice mayor to articulate uh, what the topic is, what their thoughts are. Uh, maybe ask each of the colleagues if they have a question, a specific question on what was stated or uh, needed some more clarity. And then uh, everyone get one opportunity, um, hear back, and then um, we can go ahead and then give our comments and or uh, thoughts on that. Does that sound okay with everyone just so we keep the momentum going for the meeting? Okay, no, I just saw <laughs> I thought you were, uh, uh, Councilor Mason was not talking. Okay, so everybody seems okay with that. So I'm going to begin on, again, item 7, 7A. Uh, Councilor Mason. Consideration of moving San Bruno towards a rotate, rotating mayor model through the upcoming gubernatorial special election to align with the neighboring 19 peninsula cities. Council Member Mason. Thank you. Thank you. The question around a rotational mayor was one of the first questions I received when running for city council in 2019. Being the only city in the peninsula without a rotating mayor, I supported the switch then and would say so as I got to know more San Bruno residents. In April of 2020, after the creation of a process for council members to create incentives uh, and initiatives, both council member Marty Medina and I agendized this item, but did not receive the majority support to move the initiative forward for the voters to make the decision. With the recent confirmation that there will be a recall vote on the ballot, there's another possibility to provide the opportunity to make this change to the voters. In San Bruno, we have an elected mayor that holds a two-year term needs to run every two years to hold the seat and does not have a limitation on how many terms their office can be held. The reasons behind this potential change are as follows. Number one is equity. Although largely a symbolic uh, role, the mayor is, and by title, provided opportunities that other council members are not provided. Does it matter that San Bruno has not had a female mayor invited to any regional mayoral events, mayoral list serves in over 20 years? Does it matter that when a woman did run for mayor, myself, she was asked by a fellow elected official why she ran without asking permission to run from the sitting mayor? For some, it may not matter, but for me, as an elected official who ran on the idea of change as the only female sitting council member, I think it does matter. By establishing a rotating mayor, we can ensure that those elected to office, and more importantly, those San Bruno residents we all represent, are represented on a rotating basis reflecting our constituency. It also alleviates the need for anyone of lesser economic means to worry about funding a campaign every other year, which is in and of, in of itself a daunting task unless the position continuously runs unopposed, um, as we have seen in San Bruno. Two, districting and surrounding cities. As we look to the potential of districting, an elected mayor for a single district would have a two-year term. That means that the district would have representation to the tune of 40% of every vote for a minimum of two years. A rotating mayor would offer a proportional opportunity for each district to have representation in the years ahead. This model already exists. We really are the only city in the peninsula without a rotating mayor. It's imperative that we offer our residents an opportunity to make this decision as our city continues to change and grow. We really do need proportional representation. Number four, potential revenue savings. Currently, the mayoral term is every two years and the city council term is every four years. What this means is that we have to have a, mayor, a mayoral election every two years placed on the ballot. We had previously been informed that every additional item on the ballot is an additional cost, but these costs were not itemized. So it's important that we know, prior to making a final decision, what the cost is the city to have a separate election for the mayor versus city council election. We had also been informed that a special election is significantly expensive, something to the tune of two hundred fifty to $500,000. So this here is not a special election that San Bruno would be hosting. There is a recall election that's being placed before the voters, and it's something that we can add to as opposed to having an election specifically to determine whether we would like to switch to rotational mayor or not. So what would be the cost to adding to this existing uh, recall election, this item, 
And then two, um, what is the savings to the city by not having a mayoral item separate from the city council item on the ballot every two years? And then five, a strategic initiative. At the time we had our, init our strategic initiatives, a recall had not been confirmed. Um, since it is, and since this topic has been raised by our own residents, uh, the request at this time is that we really just understand the cost to place this item on the special election ballot, the timeline by which we need to make a decision, and once this is all understood, approved, or not approved, then we either move forward with placing this item on the ballot or not. Lastly, it's important for me to note that this request is not a reflection of my opinion on our sitting mayor. It could be anyone sitting in the seat of mayor, and this request would be the same. This is a policy decision that we should consider through the lens of policymakers, through the lens of city council members in one of 20 cities where this model appears to be working and for the benefit of our residents in San Bruno. With that said, we, we are free to have a discussion. I'm open to answering any questions, but the goal is one, get the costs associated with placing this item on the recall ballot, and then two, for staff to provide that information to council to make the determination whether to move forward. Thank you to my fellow council members for listening and for entertaining this topic. Thank you, Councilmember Mason. Are there questions uh, for Councilmember Mason? And what we'll do is we'll go through the colleagues here, then I'll open it up because we do have somebody from the public, so I want to make sure we have to give that opportunity to. Any questions? Mr. Mayor, I don't have a question, but I, I'm willing to provide a comment. Well, let, let's go to questions, and then so okay. we also get it from the uh, public, and then we'll circle back as we had agreed we kind of would, and then have our okay. comments. Okay. Great. Any other questions at the time? Okay. Um, I, I think the only, and I don't know, uh, my question might be, and I don't know, it, it's not fair to Councilmember Mason, but is there any estimate of, I'll give staff a moment as we go to the public, is to what it could be. So I know we, we had an estimate of 250000 to 500000 for if we were to do it solely. Let's say it was just us in the county. So is it still to that, or do we know, do we not know? And, of course, the, un the unknown is probably uh, are other communities going to be adding on to this election? Because, obviously, the more you have, the cheaper it is. Uh, the less you have, uh, then the the city could uh, bear all the cost. Um, so with that, uh, I see no questions at this time. Let's uh, uh, open it to members of the community. And we do have a hand up. City Clerk? Uh, yes, Aros Harmon. Hello again, Aros Harmon uh, from 633 Second Ave. Um, <clears throat> I don't have super strong feelings about this because we don't have a strong mayor system. We have a mayor that is sort of a first among equals, but, you know, there are some uh, duties that are allocated to that. Uh, I think as it seems quite likely that we are going to migrate to a districted or perhaps proportional system, uh, given the California Voting Rights Act, um, I mean, I, like, I think there is something symbolically valuable in having the person that chairs the meetings who, who has that mayoral role selected by the city as a whole. And so I, I sort of feel like that the, the fact that we may be moving towards a situation where the council members are elected not by the entire city, um, rather than saying, oh, at any given time, you'd rotate through them, uh, that is instead an argument for keeping an at-large mayor. Um, I think it is a, a little odd to have the, you know, only one district at a time holding that role. So I, I hope that will be considered. Did you want to? Okay. All right, that's all. Okay, thank you for your comment. Um, the next speaker just raised their hand, uh, Claudia Quinn. Um, good evening, um, Council. Um, we would like to say that in regards to this issue, we would like to have it put on the ballot and let the voters decide what they think about it. So uh, we're very much for finding out how the voters feel. Thank you. 
Thank you for your comments. Okay. If there's any other speakers, I could ask uh, at this time to please raise your hand. I see one speaker um, in um, to be called up, and that not seeing any other hands. So here's our last speaker on the top, uh, Mr. Seymour. Uh, one, could you please bring him in? Stephen Seymour. It's actually Sandra Perez Vargas. I want to echo what Claudia said. It's you know a lot of things change and maybe a rotating the mayor might be a good change, who knows, but like Claudia said, let, let the voters decide. I think it's important to let the residents decide on this one. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Okay. Oops, I muted myself. We're going to bring it back to City Council and um, uh, with any uh, comments from colleagues? Mr. Mayor. Oh, oh, I've got Council Member Hamilton and then Vice Mayor. Uh, you, can go, you can go first. It's fine. Oh, okay. I, I, knew, I knew you wanted to go, Mr. Vice Mayor. Um, I just want to say I, I am, I am uh, supportive of exploring this and, and, of putting the, and, uh, and of putting the idea before the voters. My, uh, my, I, have, I have questions about what the cost would be, the same questions that, were, that, that um, Council Member Mason uh, but as part of her, as part of her, um, of her uh, statement about what the cost would be, both for adding to the to the recall ballot and what the ongoing potential savings would be about not having a, a, a mayoral election. But I and I also have a lot of questions about how it would work in conjunction with district elections. The um, and the, that question, that, that second question, I think would be an easy one to answer, considering that um, we have we have neighbors. Who also use who also have district elections, and as as was stated, um, we are the only city on the peninsula that has an elected mayor. So, um, I, you know, my ultimate ultimate support of it would be contingent on the answers to those questions. But I am in favor of moving moving forward to get those answers. Vice Mayor Medina. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. As uh, Councilwoman. Mason mentioned, I, I expressed my support for this earlier. Um, I believe a rotating mayor would be good for San Bruno. Um, it isn't odd in San Bruno, or it, it's odd that we do have it, that there's one out of 20 cities, but San Bruno does its own thing. And this is something that the voters would get to decide. What we're, what we're figuring out is at this point, for me, how much, is it, how much would it cost to, to, to do it in this election compared to how much would it cost to do it in the next election? Um, for me, this isn't the highest priority. Um, and um, however, without knowing the cost, which I think could be pretty simply obtained, um, from contacting the county clerk um, to get some numbers so that we can make a decision at this point, not knowing what that number is, I, I'm not going to be able to make a decision. Thank you. Um, thank you, Vice Mayor. Any other? Uh, oh, Council Member Salazar? Uh, yeah, so just um, a few comments. I, I think I, I agree with a lot of the things I'm hearing uh, across the board. Um, you know, I don't have super strong feelings uh, one way or the other about you know what what is the best governance model. Uh, the one we have is work. I, I know that um, I, I've heard you know the, the history of how we ended up here was because there was so much contention over selecting a mayor that um, it was finally decided. Well, let the people pick directly, and and so we are where we are. And um, as one of the speakers said, maybe enough time has gone by and opinions have changed. Um, I, I, what, what's really interesting is that we, we are going to have to go through the distri districting process and that could have implications on uh, how this all plays together. Pacifica, uh, for example, just uh, two years ago, they decided when they picked their districts that they would now elect a mayor. So they're, they're going in, in the other direction. They're, they're going to be electing their mayor um, starting with their next election as part of that process. So they have four districts and an elected 
mayor starting, uh, I believe, with the next election. So, um, you know, I, I'm not sure if it makes more sense to go to the voters and make this decision prior to d d doing the districts, uh, or would it make more sense to make this part of the districting discussion and um, then put it to the voters, um, or is it do we want to decide our district uh, issue first and then put this somewhere um, where we're not doing an off-year election and we get full participation? Um, uh, off-year elections tend to not get the same amount of participation, so maybe that would be uh, the, the time to look at this. Um, I mean, there's a lot of things that you know could potentially come back. Uh, I know a lot of people are interested in seeing fireworks voted on again. It's been a decade since that was decided by the voters, and Maybe opinions have changed on that, and maybe we should be looking at those things as well. And so maybe we should um, allow enough time to look at all potential things that we would want to put out there, and um, you know, uh, pretty much build out a, a, an entire ballot and put that on uh, on, on a ballot that hits, uh, which coincides with the with the general election and is more likely to get broad participation from our voters. So. Um, Again, you know, not necessarily opposed to the idea, but uh, I, I just wonder what the best way to approach it is, and if we try to do this now. I don't think there's a date set for for the election, but if it was going to be a November uh, 2021 election, uh, that I don't think that would give us a big window this year to uh, do a, a voter education and do the planning that we would have to do in order to to get uh, material available. Um, and, and again, I. I I don't think it would be fair to the voters to just kind of throw it out there and say, hey, what do you think, um, without giving them some uh, information on what the pros and cons and, and letting them understand the larger landscape of what's going to be happening with districts and, and, and so forth. So um, th those, those would be my concerns. Okay. Um, for myself, so, and I didn't know about Pacific, I do believe Half Moon Bay, uh, they are the district. Uh, I'm sorry, I, it, you're correct. I, I met Half Moon Bay, not Pacific. Oh, okay. Thank you. Because right, I was going, oh, okay. So Half Moon Bay, yeah, they are district and are going to elect a mayor. I know Burlingame is coming up with that question now. So they just had a meeting that is like, okay, we're doing districting. How do we draw it? And then do we do an elected mayor? So they're doing it all together uh, as one. Um, and I, and I think it's important for folks to know, too, it, autom it absolutely automatically has to go to the vote of the people. It is up to them. It is not up to us. This is not uh, simply where we have that option to do that. Um, and, and the history, so one thing that I, I think being on the council that I have enjoyed is that when it came to the mayor and the vice mayor, there was never a question. It's not political. Uh, it's been it's decided on the mayor and it's decided on what the council agreed to 5-0 on how the vice mayor is selected so as you know there's times in our county that other cities have uh, chosen by a 3-2 not to have somebody be the mayor or vice mayor or have that person serve uh, twice in a row uh, and I and we've all read those so we don't need to go into specific examples that's been the nice thing that it doesn't become political at that time, and then it's clear direction based on um, what uh, the voters have decided in the municipal code. And it is it is true how we got here is a person who should have been could have been rotated into mayor. It was was not selected, and that's how it started a voter initiative because they said, "Hey, hold on," and so it went to the vote of the people. That uh, gentleman who was over, uh, who was bypassed for rotation, became the first elected mayor, and in two years he lost re-election. So that's the evolution of how it happened. The also the reason for the every two years is because what the folks from the history I know is that they wanted three people up each two years, so majority of the council could be changed, and the direction of the city could change as well, because then you'd have to wait four years for three members to come up. So that was their rationale back then as well for that. I don't know that there's an additional cost for the mayor being on every two years because you have two council members that are up. 
So unless somebody runs, then there's that. But you're always having that because you have two council members that are up each time. So I think it's also the district. I kind of share some of the sentiment of uh, Council Member Salazar is how do you know when the, the right time is to, to do this? I believe it would be more costly in 219 than 220. I believe that the reason the state has mandated us to go into even years elections was to get the largest voter turnout and have the best uh, opportunity for democracy. And that's why even years has been done. Um, I also... I believe we get the cost. It may be more than we, we think, I believe, but, but again, I, I don't truly know. I think I'd ask that question for staff does know um, of those, those costs. But let me pause there and see if there's any, um, any idea from staff. All right. Thank you, Mayor Medina. Uh, so staff does not know uh, the cost to hold a uh, city election tied to the gubernatorial recall election. Uh, the date for the recall election has not been set. Um, uh, it, they were looking at either late October or early November. Um, our city clerk has uh, been in communication with other city clerks as well as the county. Uh, that date uh, is currently not set. We hope to know that date sometime in June. Uh, which is, if this item is supported tonight, we would hope to return to the city council by the second meeting in June, if we know that date. Uh, but that date is critical because that date tells us the date that we would have to submit our local item to the county. Uh, and once that date is known, we will be able to ask and get a firm uh, or a close to a firm number from, uh, from the county on what the cost will be. Our city clerk has also talked to her counterpart city clerks uh, in, uh, in the county just to get a sense, are there any other cities that may be uh, looking at a local measure tied to the gubernatorial recall? We have heard back from 14 of the 20 cities uh, with only two saying maybe. And so <laughs> there are two more uh, people um, potentially where we are sort of looking at the potential for a gubernatorial recall election or, or the certainty of a gubernatorial recall election, uh, but waiting on that date uh, to decide whether they would um, have a local item on the ballot. And as we know from prior elections, the number of local items actually decreases the cost um, for each individual agency. And so all of that is really hopefully going to play out over the next month or so. Uh, and uh, should this item be supported, uh, we have been noting the questions that the city council have asked, both with respect to elections, the cost of elections, as well as uh, the district election process. And so we can uh, bring back some information from the city council at that time. What I was going to, uh, thank you. One of my final thing was, is I know is about the district elections, you know, it's not to say we have to have five districts or four districts and an elected mayor. You could have seven districts. You don't know because we haven't had that discussion yet. We haven't looked at the census. We haven't seen all of that data. And so, therefore, um, you know, are we, you know, is it, is it make more sense to have it all done at once so it can be before the, the, the people? Or do you do it in sections when we don't know the other answer to the districting? Yet, because we have obviously yet discussed that yet. Anyway, those are those are uh, my comments. But like uh, Vice Mayor Medina kind of said, you, you, there's the unknown, and I think for a lot of us, it's cost. If it's high, then I think uh, as as we were in strategic initiatives last year, it was like, hey, if, you know, that's why Councilman Mason pulled it off. It was like, hey, that's way too much. So um, not at this time. So anyway, those are my comments. I appreciate everybody uh, with their comments. So, Councilmember Mason has asked for this to come back with some of the detail. I think the city manager kind of outlined it pretty good. Um, and uh, uh, Vice Mayor Medina, did you uh, and Council Member Hamilton, you were uh, yes to bring it back with more data. Okay. And Vice Mayor Medina, are you okay to bring it back with uh, additional data and information? Yeah, we, we need, yes, Mr. Mayor, we, we need the cost. And until you ask, you don't know what it's going to be. And whenever they can give us a number, you know, ballpark would be helpful. And then um, we go from there. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Salazar? 
as long as this request for information isn't going to uh, impact any other uh, deliverables that we assign to staff, I mean, that's always a concern, right? I, I don't know how big of an app this is, so as long as uh, staff is uh, okay with bringing this back uh, within the time frame, which is also, you know, makes it, makes it difficult, but uh, as long as we're not uh, derailing any other efforts, um, I'm, I'm in favor of bringing back the information. I would concur uh, with Councilmember Salazar as far as, you know, you've got a month and or so. And as we bring on other tasks, I, I just want us to keep in mind, we're asking, we had initiatives, but we're asking for stuff. So uh, I think all of us are encouraged. It, it's almost hard to make a decision because you don't know the facts of the decision. And I know for me, costs are going to count. I, I, and I'm sorry, I'm not trying to say, you know, but you're talking two hundred fifty thousand dollars or something um, versus what it could cost going forward but also I would like to have it quantified as far as what is the cost for having the mayor on on every two years because you already have council elections so I, I would like just that because it's been raised and I don't know how it could be more if if in essence you already have an election so um, because what you would be doing is having if everybody was rotated you would only be having three people every four years, uh, but you still would be having it, so you just would miss a seat uh, every two. Um, and maybe a little bit of the history. I know you heard my version of, of what I've read, but it doesn't make uh, me the historian either, so I think some of that would be helpful. So I think you have your direction from the council is to please uh, ask the question, get the uh, details, bring it back uh, to the council, and you had said the second meeting in June, and I think we will uh, wait for the report. Did you need any more uh, clarification, City Manager? No additional clarification. I, I do think it's important to, to know, um, as of late, there's been additional re requests for the information that we would bring back. Um, I, I am not sure that we will be able to do a detailed financial breakdown of the cost from past elections and how much of that was attributable to the mayor mayoral election, as well as to bring back the full history on the city's mayoral processes. And, and, and so I, I do think that we can bring back um, high level information that is necessary for the city council to understand the cost, know the date, know the time, know the deliverables, uh, and can bring back some information on our district elections process and the timing on that because we are uh, uh, <laughs> currently working with the vendor and we'll be bringing forward a full schedule for that process. And so I, I, I do think that there's some uh, uh, valuable information that we can bring back. Whether we can decouple all of those costs and, and bring you a um, what I call completed staff work uh, analysis on, on, on cost and history. Uh, we will certainly look into that and, of course, uh, attempt to uh, meet council's objective. I appreciate that clarification. And, yeah, I wouldn't, yeah, didn't expect a, a, a history <laughs> lesson, and so maybe I gave you that wrong impression. Um, okay, so uh, staff, uh, staff, I apologize. Uh, council has given direction to staff, and I appreciate that. And I know Council Member Mason has a second item as well. Do you, can I just really quickly oh, before we move on? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. I just wanted to make sure. I do think it's important when we look at the, when we look at the cost. I think the 2020 election was kind of an odd. I shouldn't say an odd election, but turnout was significantly greater than I think in in past years is what I've seen in the numbers. So I do think it's important to see maybe the last two elections what the cost is um, for having these items on the ballot. So if we could just um, have that, um, that would be great. Thank you. Okay. Let's go on to the next item uh, for Councilmember Mason. Direct the Hart Committee to draft a resolution for City Council appro approval affirming the City's commitment to stand in solidarity with the Black community and condemn racism. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Medina, this is another item that was originally proposed last year. Um, in lieu of consensus on this item, the Council uh, created the Heart Committee. Since the creation of the Heart Committee, we have yet to review this original request. 
we have in a very short time period provided a resolution to stand in solidarity with the AAPI community, which I think we're all um, proud of. And at this time, one year later, on the anniversary of George Floyd's death, it's really important that we provide the same solidarity to the black community and condemn racism. Chair Salazar requested direction from the council recently for a charge to the Heart Committee. As the vice chair, I am now requesting that the council provide the Heart Committee the direction to move forward with this resolution and bring it back for council approval at the next meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Um, by colleagues, questions. And if anybody in the community has any, um, they can raise their hand. Um, if not, comments from, from council. Uh, I, I don't mind starting, or I'm sorry. Okay, is that all right, Tom? Okay. You so, go over, right? <laughs> <laughs> I know, I'm going out. I just thought I'll, I'll go Gotta first. the rules, Mr. Mayor. Oh, that, you are, you know what, Ashley, because I did state that in the beginning. So let's, let's not off track, let's, let's stick to the plan. Council member Hamilton. Uh, I am I am absolutely supportive of this. The the the, the heart committee was was formed out of this question and the and the and this request and this request never was was, was never addressed. Um, and this is this seems like a, a fairly easy thing for us to to remedy and something that we that we would need to remedy. I am absolutely supportive of this. Um, thank you. Other um, uh, Mr. Salazar, any? Uh, no, I, I don't have any questions. Got it. Uh, and, oh, I said, that's right. We're, we're on comments because there were no questions. I apologize. We're, we're moving faster than I, than I realized. Uh, Vice Mayor Medina. Yes, uh, Mr. Mayor, I fully support this. Um, and uh, I look forward to it. Thank you. And for myself, I'm, I'm fine with it as well. What I would ask, um, I know this is not the intent of the council member, but when it says direct heart committee, I'd like it to be more of a, a kind of an encouragement because I'd like it organic, right, to come from a heart committee. When we decided the purpose of it, uh, there were four bullet points for the purpose, which we all saw and we concurred to. One was to seek community input and the perception of racial and social equity within San Bruno to build trust and strengthen partnerships among local community-based organizations, public agencies, neighborhood groups, and religious organizations to explore and evaluate successful models and best practices for racial and social equity. Two more bullets. Develop and support the implementation of events to enhance the San Bruno Stands United Against Hate campaign. And finally, submit recommendations for action to the San Bruno City Council designated to reduce or eliminate racial and social inequities and help the city of San Bruno better serve its diverse community. I'd like to remind that this was the purpose of why it was formed, um, and this is what its purpose was. And so I think, again, it was to come from this group, sitting, knowing, uh, and it holds two members of the city council, two representatives from San Bruno Park School District, two representatives from Cappuccino High, two representatives from the business community, and two members from the general community. So I would like to see um, that we go to what we had decided. I, I think what I do hear from folks at times is, okay, a resolution comes. We all feel we could probably, if it was on the agenda, we could vote on it right now and we'd be done. But at the same time, then what's the next step? Um, it's been a year, as Councilmember Mason said, so what has transpired in the year? Because pieces of paper that get filed in the archives are not moving the ball forward in order to address what I think the purpose also is. So I'd like the committee, the heart committee, when they get back, is to kind of go back to its original purpose too, and maybe explore some of those other items that were, uh, as we all concurred to what, what its purpose was. So I think a heart committee has their direction from council is bring them together. Um, oh, and Councilor Mason, did you have any other items other than the ones listed just um, from comments from yourself? Yeah, just some quick um, updates, just that uh, I'm really, I just hope staff looks into state and federal assistance for individuals who are behind on their utility bills. The numbers are quite high and there's a number of services right now available and hopefully we can prominently display those on our city website through our social media outlets. Um, it, it helps us, we get paid back and it really helps the residents to ensure that they have, um, their, that their needs are being met. 
Um, I also received a mailer from um, California Treasurer Fiona Ma and wanted to encourage um, individuals uh, to open college savings opportunity accounts, or also known as uh, 529, 529s. Um, apparently, and I apologize, but I have it right in front of me, um, they're 100% tax-free growth towards the children's college education, but what I wanted to make sure I said right was that between May 24th and May 31st, there's a $50 incentive for opening. So um, this is a, a mailer that I think we all got, but I wanted to share that. And then the last thing is um, that a lot of individuals may not know that the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development has recently allotted a significant amount of emergency housing vouchers um, to cities across the country and counties across the country. And San Mateo received 217 of these emergency housing vouchers. So I am hoping that we are somehow working. I'm not the contact for uh, life moves. I'm not sure um, if the city is still meeting with them uh, on a regular basis, but these have to be allotted very quickly. They have to be used quickly. And um, if life moves can connect some of our homeless residents in San Bruno to these emergency housing vouchers, we would stabilize their housing situations. And I think it's a, it's a pretty uh, unique opportunity given uh, where we are right now um, with COVID-19 and with the opportunity. So I just want to really encourage staff to connect with the county and the, um, the Housing Authority of San Mateo to determine whether any of our homeless participants are eligible or on the referral basis to receive any of these emergency housing voucher, vouchers. Thank you. Thank you. Now we're going to move on to item B under comments from council members. Marty, uh, Vice Mayor Marty Medina request to agendize a study session to discuss the creation of, of the Downtown Improvement Ad Hoc Committee. Yes, Mr. Mayor, thank you very much. Um, so yes, a few weeks ago I uh, first mentioned the formation of a Downtown Improvement Committee and I'm following the process that, that uh, we have of, of trying to agendize uh, this topic. And why I wanted to have a study session about it is because I think it's important enough to hear from all of the council. Um, I enjoyed working with uh, Councilman Hamilton on the uh, Clean San Bruno uh, subcommittee, and um, I believe uh, we succeeded in bringing our recommendation to the council. So. Um, why have a downtown improvement committee? Um, well, our council has been hearing from the public for, for years about what can we do to improve our downtown. And this council and, 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 and the, this council and the previous council in the previous couple of years have done a lot with, with staff, you know, providing the work of, of generating a downtown parking plan downtown management parking plan in 2019, a streetscape plan in 2019, uh, updated the parking standards in, in 2020. So um, recently in this this year, we are already uh, with tonight approved for funding for, for activating Centennial Plaza. We're pursuing a grant for improving Post Park and uh, Council at the last council meeting uh, approved the replacement of garbage cans. Uh, City crews this uh, past week completed uh, the parking improvements with the addition of green and white uh, loading zones and parking zones to help move move people um, safely to get into certain areas and to kind of encourage people to, to get their. Uh, uh, purchases completed and, and open up a spot for somebody else. So all, all along this, we know, I know, council is extremely busy. We know that our budget is tight and we're entering other budget cycles. So yet still, what more can we, what more can the council do to improve downtown? How do we address vacant storefronts and, and how can we make those vacant storefronts look much better than they do now. I had the uh, opportunity to walk with the mayor today, and a couple of those 
vacant storefronts are in the same condition for years. Um, so this uh, this uh, ad hoc committee would, would would do some of the research and, and looking at what other cities are doing to improve the appearance of these vacant storefronts through their municipal code. Other question, what can we do to welcome and attract new businesses? How do we improve the partnership with the Chamber of Commerce? How can we improve the communication and, and build relationships with our existing businesses? We need to build the trust. We need, we need to get the confidence that we are there to support them. Um, what events can we have downtown? Can we have a car show? Can we have a festival? Can we have musical and art events? Where where will the clean, clean sweep a neighborhood sale? Uh, I don't think it was called a garage sale, but that we had in the park it was the clean sweep sale, maybe. But um, flea market. What was it? It was a flea market. The flea market. Okay. I didn't really want to call downtown a flea market, but okay. <laughs> so, what, so what can we do? Can we do something like that? Can we do it in a parking lot? What What does this council think that they can do? Even even though staff's really busy, what can we do to encourage art, to work with the Culture and Arts Commission, and 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 let's get some art. We're, as we activate the Centennial Park, that artwork likely is going to go away. And, and it's encouraging to know that we're going to do something about it and make it livelier there. So this downtown improvement committee will, will, will review these questions and provide some recommendations to council to uh, move it a little more forward. Um, I spoke with um, a San Bruno committee member here uh, and I, I won't try to pronounce his last name, but John, who has nuts for candy down in, in uh, Burlingame, who has experience, um, vast experience with, with, with working in, in building a downtown. And a business improvement district was, was something that we briefly touched on. But that, for me, is way down the road as we continue building upon the trust that we have in our community, in our business owners, to get the investors to, to take a bigger chance in San Bruno. So I'm asking my colleagues to agendize the study session so we can have these conversations in public. Thank you. Okay, I just want, uh, I'm just, I am going out turn, but just for clarity, because it says study session and then it says an ad hoc committee. So what I think, correct me, please. The ask is to have the full council in a study session in regards to downtown. Okay. Just want to make sure that would be the first step. Yes, sir. Okay. Perfect. I just want to make sure since it said both. Um, okay. Uh, questions of uh, the vice mayor on what he has uh, brought before us. Uh, council member Hamilton. So, um, so then my question would be, cause I, I, I have, I have questions about what, you know, specifically the remit of this committee be, but it sounds like those questions would be brought up and discussed in the study session that you're asking for. Is that what, is that, is that fair, Mr. Vice Mayor? Um, that would be fair. I brought up a number of the questions here and in, in this, uh, these comments that we could look into, mm -hmm. but perhaps maybe the, the council doesn't want to look into that and, and wants to limit it specifically to something else. I, I want to be really focused. I want to actually get something done here. I think we have a lot of great momentum going forward in our downtown, and I want to build upon that, and I know staff's really busy. Right. And I understand that eventually whatever we're going to give them is going to take their time, but we have to be strategic and, and helpful in, in whatever we can do. Um, I didn't mention, I, 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 I forgot that um, um, to get people downtown is to, to, to have some additional events with with either um, I know the chamber did some uh, wine events um, and there was some great uh, enthusiasm for that of course uh, but then COVID hit and it just put everything like to a screeching halt in the whole world so it um, I look forward to it 
I think it's, it's really a promising time that, that we can continue building on, on, on improving our downtown. Okay. Uh, other uh, questions from colleagues? Questions, not comment. Uh, Councilmember Salazar. And so my question would be just um, if we're talking study sessions specifically, and, and, and uh, Vice Mayor, I, I, I like the enthusiasm that, that's coming around, um, you know, the effort and the ideas that you're throwing out there. I think there's, there's a lot of potential there. So um, I'm really thinking that, you know, having a, a, a working subcommittee could be a real asset and, and something that could help build the momentum. But just in terms of scheduling a study session, so study sessions have historically been uh, staff reports on uh, s topics of, of, you know, that require a lot of information. And so if we're talking a study session, I mean, I mean it, it almost sounds like we're talking more brainstorming than study session where there really wouldn't be uh, a staff report. Staff's not going to bring anything back for us to review and understand and learn and all that. Um, so maybe um, I, just a suggestion, maybe we can just bring this back as an agendized discussion for the council to, to prioritize some items and then uh, take the action to create the, the subcommittee from there. Because I, I don't think we really need a lot of prepared stuff. I, it just let, let's agendize a, a brainstorming session as part of one of our regular meetings or as a special meeting. That, absolutely fine with that. Um, for lack of coming up with a better term, is the, the thing that we're used to, either having a study session on something from the council or, or having what what else do we call it, right? So, but mm -hmm. having that open discussion where it's agendized so we can freely talk about it and we can share with our community of, of what our vision is and how we could, as a council, and I think we're, we're, we're already proven that we're, we're working together to get stuff done. Mm -hmm. So, um, Yes, call, we can call it a break army session. That's fine, too. Okay. Seeing no other hands up, uh, my question would be, and I know it's not new, but, you know, even when we you used to have the farmer's market, right? And so the, that was done. And now, in retrospect, was Sunday not uh, a good day to do that? It is a Saturday, but then there's a competition. So uh, I think, you know, for this brainstorming, I think it's probably best. Um because what I what I would think, and I'm going to clarify because what uh, Councilmember Salazar said is that staff wouldn't need to prepare. They right. wouldn't need to organize. They I can also see on the other side of they're going, oh my gosh, right. got right. a blank canvas, and everybody take a brush and start painting, and God knows where we're going to end up. And then um, the the would be what can we do? And I think what I heard from you, which I liked, was, um, hey, let let's narrow the scope. Let's, let's accomplish some things and not put 40 things on downtown because we know it won't happen. We just know. But what can we do and uh, maybe the councils, because it may take uh, finances. You know, where's the money coming from? Or maybe we, as the chamber is the one who led the charge on the farmer's market. It was at the mall before. Um, you, we talked about the wine tasting. You're correct. And there was the Bay Hill Champagne that used to be on uh, San Bernardino Avenue uh, for years. And that was that was uh, cars. Mary Costa uh, organized that uh, because of the, the cars and what have you. And so that added some activity. I think the other objective is it's about improvement, but I think improvement, if I'm hearing you correct too, is uh, activities to bring folks down. I know we talked and briefly, you know, we've got the 4th of July Pee Wee tournament. Do we quit, but do we have that opportunity to bring those folks from outside of town to come down to have a meal or do whatever they need to do. So take those opportunities as well. Um, so, um, but I think I've heard that. And uh, Councilmember Mason has her hand up. Yeah, sorry, I was into science. I was looking for the new, the priority initiative that we had. So what if we narrow down to what we have on the initiative? So for example, um, you know, there's Clint San Bruno. How does that, um, what does that look like in our downtown, right? We have the um, small attraction program. What would that What would that mean for the downtown businesses? Um, we have the summer Saturdays or Sundays for street closures. Could that be a car show? Could that be the you know the tree lighting? Could that be I don't know what day the tree lighting would fall on this year. But those are um, three I'm looking at right now. 
And so I wonder if we can maybe further um, define what we have and then we can make them achievable for this year. Um, and I would support that initiative so that we're not, we're, we're not going outside of the, the bounds um, and maybe hopefully just assisting staff a little bit by narrowing down the instruction. So I don't know if that helps, but I was just thinking that as I looked at our strategic initiatives for this year. Okay, thank you. And don't think, uh, I know the hand just went up, but city manager, I certainly was not gonna leave you off the list. We wanna include you for your thoughts and comments. Sure, uh, well, thank you, ma'am. And uh, just a few uh, offhand comments. Certainly, uh, uh, should the city council desire to have a study session to talk about downtown, uh, we can agendize that. I think the first thing that comes to mind is, well, of, of course, there's a desire both on staff and on council to take a dedicated focus and, and uh, look at areas where we can uh, make improvements downtown, those that have already been directed to staff or other. It's important to note that in June, council will be really busy um, with everything related to budget. And so um, we're even in, uh, in looking at the conversations that we know you will have around budget that we don't typically have, like ARA funding uh, and city that uh, we might be looking for additional special meetings in June. And so sort of looking at what's before you as well as regular business, I really don't see uh, your ability to have this uh, study session in June, and so we're probably talking July. Um, and then I think there are other initiatives that are really getting ready to uh, kick off that I, I want to make sure that both staff and council have enough time uh, to talk about and move forward. Uh, and while I totally understand the sentiment of let's agendize a brainstorming session and no work needs to be done with staff, I've been doing this long enough to know that tons of staff prep is needed every time the city council gets together to talk about a conversation. Uh, because there will be questions about, oh, well, well, maybe the subcommittee can do this, but what do we do, what do we do about that now, right? And, and, and how does staff interface with, with the chamber and uh, what would it take to have a municipal code change to address X? There's gonna need to be uh, some coalescing of staff that support uh, a number of the things that Council Member Medina mentioned. In addition, I think it's important to point out that the city council has already developed and adopted a set of strategic initiatives for the city council to work on, many of which relate to downtown. And a little bit of what I hear uh, is, well, maybe council can take on some of those. Um, but without looking at the list, um, with all of those that you directed to staff really require staff time and staff input to really work on and bring before you. Um, and so if, if the direction of the, of the committee is to look at sort of how to do those faster or, or prioritize them, uh, I think there's a little um, staff analysis that's gonna be needed because what we said uh, when you adopted your strategic initiative is one, we were gonna see how many we could afford to fund that required funding in, in the proposed budget that, that, that you're gonna get and act on for next fiscal year. And then we would also return to you with a schedule because all of those initiatives that you adopted, staff doesn't have time to work on immediately. And some of them, as we mentioned, won't even begin for six months. And so I think it's important that we be allowed to do that work um, so there's not a sort of front loading of something that you've already directed staff and now we then need to readjust um, the things that, are, that, that you've already addressed staff to. So in summary, if, if, if council directs it, absolutely we will support it. The recommendation is to uh, look to have it sometime in July uh, and, and certainly staff will do uh, a little preparation based on the items that have been mentioned tonight just so we're prepared and the right people are there uh, and, uh, and we've had some initial conversations around the work that's already planned and already ongoing related to downtown. mute myself. Thank you, city manager, uh, because I think that's important. And I think, you know, 
we need to be realistic. We need to understand time, staff's time, and timeline because obviously the budget is a priority in June with some of the other uh, council um, objectives that we have and staff needs to keep us on track with getting that done. So what I've heard from uh, council is that yes, on a study session, city manager has told us, you know, realistically July probably be the earliest after the budget's been approved and that's behind the department heads. What I've also heard from council is that let's, let's uh, like council member Mason said, hey, there's some items already there and maybe they're already in, in the pipeline and they're already scheduled out, and uh, but let's be realistic with what we're trying to achieve and, and look at uh, potential things to add uh, uh, a good environment that maybe brings folks uh, to the downtown as well as uh, do what we can with staff staff situation. Did I grasp that okay, folks? Vice Mayor? Yeah, I guess, um, I, I'm fine with it. With the big study session happening in July, um, the appointment of the members of, of the subcommittee, the, my, my intent would be hoping that it's quite different when you talk to somebody saying that you're on the subcommittee than you're just the one council member and that you are proceeding with um, with trying to, to accomplish these things, right? Um, perhaps this is a city attorney question. Do we have to wait to have this session to, to appoint the committee members or could we appoint them now? City attorney. Yes, thank you. Uh, you cannot appoint committee members now unless that was specifically agendized. There's a relatively recent case that that says that. So you, you'd have to... Uh, That's fine. Different okay. for that. Thought I'd ask. <laughs> okay. Uh, appreciate the clarity, City Attorney. Uh, uh, Vice Mayor Medina, anything, any other comments for this evening? I do have one, um, one last uh, comment announcement. Um, Thursday at Bel Air School, the Second Harvest Food Distribution. Uh, people have been lining up before two o'clock, and the line gets pretty long. Uh, we we generally get up through close to two hundred vehicles, or one hundred eighty vehicles and twenty walk-ups. So Thursday, Bel Air, um, it starts at two. Thank you. If you need food, um, you show up. You can register right there on the spot. Um, other, uh, uh, okay, thank you. Uh, other uh, comments from my colleagues? Uh, first, Council Member Salazar, then we'll go to Council Member Hamilton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I, I know we, we mentioned this at the beginning, but I think it's important enough to, to reiterate uh, COVID-19 vaccines uh, are available and they're important. I got mine. I'm fully vaccinated uh, as of last Thursday. So. Um, I, I also wanted to uh, uh, make a plug. Uh, our partners over at Cappuccino High School uh, wanted to get the word out that they're hosting their clinic on Wednesday, June 2nd. So uh, they have the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, they're doing uh, kids uh, 12 years and up, uh, adults as well. And uh, for people that are already fully vaccinated, they also need volunteers for that day to help with the, uh, with the process. So I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you. Thank you for uh, mentioning that. Uh, Council Member Hamilton. Okay, I just I have one, one item quickly. Um, earlier this year, Council Member Salazar and I held a virtual town hall for residents. It was very well attended and in my opinion was a really good opportunity for residents to engage with, with Council in a more direct way to discuss city issues and raise questions. Um, I'm hopeful that uh, you, my colleagues, can commit to teaming up to hold additional town halls on a regular and ongoing basis, perhaps quarterly, which would mean the next one would start getting scheduled sometime soon. Um, and I would suggest that we rotate members and commit to at least try to at least try to go through all the available pairings of us um, uh, before we repeat any pairings. Um, I know we can't discuss this because this was not agendized, but I wanted to plant the seed with you guys, with, 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 with my colleagues tonight. I intend to request this to be agendized for council comments so we can discuss it. Um, in our next meeting. Thank you, Councilmember Hamilton. Thank you, Councilmember Salazar, on the vax, uh, vaccine at, at Cappuccino. 
uh, it's June 2nd, and the second one would be on June 23rd, and yes, they are looking for help and signals and et cetera, but um, thank you for bringing that up. For myself, um, I wanted to say we had a, well, we call it now an all-hands meeting agenda, um, and this is for the county. Believe it or not, it's been a year serving on that, um, and this is where, you know, we get the vaccination updates, uh, emergency rental assistance, workforce recovery, small business recovery, education and digital equity and child care. These are subsets of these bodies that a lot of us were asked to join, and then we have now in all hands. And I won't ramble all the numbers, but looking at the presentation on what the county slash municipality towns have done and the outreach that has been had in all kinds of um, areas has been rather in, impressive and uh, is a testament to you know what we've been doing thus far um, and the nonprofits that have been helped, the meals that have been provided, uh, et cetera. So it was encouraging because uh, I think for the first time in the year or the more than a year we've been meeting, it's uh, everybody's feeling a little more optimistic and everybody's feeling a little more hopeful and everybody's seeing a light somewhere. Uh, but as was mentioned, um, June 15th is still not here, and we need to keep on the right track, do the right thing in order to ensure uh, that we keep moving forward and don't take a pause and move backward. Um, also, I want to, and I've just uh, got to say, show that we're getting some normalcy back, is that uh, I want to wish uh, the class of 2021 at Cappuccino High School this Thursday We'll be having an in-person graduation uh, with precautions and modifications. Uh, last year, obviously, was virtual. So uh, I'm sure the class, though, have not been to class to, to be together and have that experience, I think, is something uh, we can be happy for and, and know that, again, we're moving in the right direction. So uh, happy graduation to them. Uh, with that said, I will go ahead, and then we will adjourn this meeting this evening to the next regular city council meeting, which will be held on June 8th, 2021 at 7 p.m. Everybody enjoy the rest of your week. Be safe.